taking care of California Act Solutions, running this business. Um, for those of you who don't know who California Act Solutions are, who I am, um, I have actually been on both sides of the desk, I guess you could say. I run California Act Solutions, but also in the past, I was a farm manager as a customer of California Act Solutions. And so that, that's how I originally got interact, the interactions was with Monty, who's the founder standing back there. Um, first time I met him, I was managing a large dairy operation, um, about 15,000 acres, all kinds of forages, almonds, sugar beets, a little bit of tomatoes. And what was interesting is I had a lot of challenges, a lot of problems as a farm manager, as I'm sure a lot of you guys who manage farms have a lot of problems and challenges. And so Monty was someone who was very different than the typical uh, ag salesman. He was not trying to push a product. He was actually trying to teach me some of the uh, things and solutions that could solve my problems. And to me, that was extremely valuable. I wasn't looking for a product. I was looking for a solution to fix these problems. And so he sometimes jokes about how I kept him hostage in my uh, truck for about two and a half hours as we drove around and looked at all these problems. But he was teaching me why these are problems. And so as he was teaching me how these things could be fixed and solved, I was also learning, okay, what is it that I can change in my management that didn't cost me anything? I didn't have to spend money. I just had to have an open mind to be able to learn from somebody. And that was one of the key things. And I hope that we can have that same idea here, is learning how we can manage things better to improve our bottom line. Says. I'll try to, uh, usually I, I do a little PowerPoint and today I, I ended up not doing it because I thought I'd change things up and make people watch PowerPoints and get lost. So, um, so I'll start out and you know, we've got the, uh, the uh, NRCS here in RCD and, and specifically that's what I'll talk to start with. Those, thank you, Mark. Uh, specifically that's what I'll talk about today is I better sit down because I, I like to use my hands, um, uh, about being a farmer. So I'm, my name is Matt Angel. I'm with the local resource conservation district. And um, I'm a, a water expert. But what's most relevant to, to all of you is that I'm a local family farmer. And so as Silas said, you know, uh, just like all of us, we're trying to increase our game. Uh, to increase productivity and reduce inputs, so uh, that's critical. Um, a little bit, I mean, people ask me all the time, what's an RCD? Uh, RCDs is a resource conservation district, and they were formed uh, during the Dust Bowl. And uh, uh, you all know what happened during the Dust Bowl. Yeah, uh, the, the idea was is that they would form a rural uh, organizations or working groups uh, became boards uh, that were f that were funded federally by the state. Uh, the idea was to transfer technical knowledge, uh, just like Silas said, new ideas and innovation, so that growers uh, could implement that. So my dad sat on the board like 40 years ago, and the new technology at that time was something called ripping and uh, land leveling. And what they did was uh, they took surplus con uh, equipment from the army. Uh, they put it in the hands of uh, growers, and uh, they rented that equipment, and uh, over time, that, that's what uh, enabled them to, to grow the organization. Uh, as we evolved, um, we kind of took a little, a little uh, break, uh, but, but during that time, you know, during the Dust Bowl, what, what the idea was to conserve natural resources like water, soil, uh, about biological foundation. Um, so six years ago, we merged with Chowchilla Red Top. Uh, that allowed us to become, uh, uh, in, in state terms, more compliant, and, uh, which means that uh, we're a Section 9 organization, which means that just like a university or any uh, state organization, we have the ability to, to get funding. Uh, through that, uh, merger. Uh, the district now is about a little over a half a million acres from uh, the west end of the county almost to the well to the east end of the county. Uh, we have a website. Uh, Amy Sizzlebaum is our new uh, director. 
Uh, she does a great job. Our website uh, offers a lot of information. And then um, our, our other job is to work with the NRCS and talk about what, the, what their local concerns are. Um, so when, when Silas said that farmers are resistant and innovative, <laughs> without question, uh, when they started using ethanol probably 15 years ago, they thought that it would take farmers about five to, five to six years to catch up with the demand. Uh, that challenge was thrown out there, and within one year, uh, we're producing more corn to produce more ethanol than ever before. So that is the story of farmers. They're innovative and truly resilient. Um, I, I think Silas hit on it is, for me, I think what changed my idea and a little bit of my history, we started out in cover crops in vineyards. Um, and it was, it was interesting, I mean, I just didn't understand it. My father-in-law uh, actually had his own chemical company in Delano, uh, was a, a research educator at Colorado State, and tried to offer me his cover crop uh, company uh, 30 years ago, and I just didn't even understand what they did, even though we were planning them. So this evolution of cover crops, I think, as we look at it, there's been people who have used it over time. Um, unfortunately, because of EuroWatch, uh, we have a local grower that sits on our RCD board that actually quit growing cover crops this year because of EuroWatch. And we'll talk a little bit about that, because I think those are some of the controversies that we uh, are challenged with. But. Uh, with cover crops, I just looked at them and said, well, we're going to plant them and we just them under, and I don't know how effective they were. Then I got on the board, the MRCS said there was money available, and I'm, I'm not interested in free money. What I'm interested in is the ability to change my game, to become the best at my game. And so the challenge that I had was that um, because I grow almonds, uh, we typically prepare those beds for harvest, the surface is always hard in the middle. So 50% of our ground doesn't have anything on it. And I, so I, I, somebody said, well, let's put cover crops on it. And my mind went back to, I used to plant rye, I used to plant, you know, wheat, and I didn't know how effective it was. And then, you know, I started looking at my problems. I started putting chemicals on to open up the ground because I was having an infiltration rate, or an infiltration rate problem. Right? wasn't getting water down into my crop. And if any of you know me, I'm a measurement guy. And it's like Silas said, you know, I, I'm not 100% sure that I'm, you know, I'm always the smartest guy in the room, but I know that if I measure things, and, then, and, I, and when I measure them, and why I measure them, I actually get to see what the outcome was. And I think that as I watched what was going on in my own crop, I thought, I'm just not hitting it. The drought hit us in 12, and uh, what happened was is that my soil started to dry up. I was putting, a, I was putting fertilizers on. I was, you know, I was in the top 5% of the uh, county in yield. And uh, the next year, my crop was off, and I'm like, what's going on? So we did soil samples, and I had a, soil, I had a salt problem, right? And I thought, how am I going to solve this salt problem when I put more chemicals on and I can't get to, you know, I can't open that ground up and especially with the drought, we just didn't have any rain. There was no, uh, we weren't doing any leaching or anything like that. So I think it was really important for me to start to understand what was going on in my crop, why it was being reduced. I was using chemicals, the, the conventional solution, but nothing was happening. And so why we're here today is to listen to one another. Growers help each other as best as anybody. I think Silas said it well, is that, you know, we, we sit here and, and uh, we go to these different seminars, we listen to different things, we listen to our PCAs, you need to put this many units of nitrogen on, you need to do this with potassium, blah, blah, blah. And so really, the question was, the game was still the bare ground uh, that was unprotected, and I, I, I just knew that something, I, I wasn't solving my problem. So, uh, Silas so invited me out, and I, and I have a really good friend. Her name's Norma Stretch. I don't know how many people know Norma Stretch, uh, but her family basically, they were the, the breeders of the original Monterey tree. Anybody got Monterey's out here? 
if you grow almonds, you almost have to have a long array of it. So the bottom line is that, that Norma is one of those people that you can't convince to do anything. But right down the road, um, the East family, uh, Shannon was growing some uh, uh, cover crops in a, in a plant down there. And Norma says, hey, get in the truck and come down here and look. I got down there and I was like, she shows me this amazing cover crop. And there's safflower in there. There's, or excuse me, sunflower. There's, you know, just this huge variety. There's wheat, there's trefoil, there's clovers, there's radishes, there's everything growing in this cover crop. I'm like, wow, I've never seen cover crop like this. So that's the point, right? We're site specifically, what is the soil that we have? What's our, what's our climatic condition? And what are we trying to achieve? And I think sometimes, you know, the state comes out from CDF and they say, hey, you know, we need to, we need to have healthy soils. And in the back of your mind, like, man, I got so many other problems other than a healthy soil. And you don't think of it as I'm trying to improve the health of my soil. So once I started looking at that, it's like, okay, that's a great big cover crop. It's late in the year. What's going to happen? You know, as I said, I'm a water guy, consumptive wise. So I started listening to people. And here's the technology. And it's almost like the technology my dad had. A guy named. Uh, Rob Shue shows up at a field day, and he says, this is how I cut my cover crop. So the key to cover crops, and what I think is critical, is that it's winter cover crops, right? We need to talk about winter cover crops, not just year-round cover crops, but winter crops, winter crop, cover crops specifically. So we end up, uh, I stopped listening to Rob Shue, and he goes, you know, when I flail it, I flail about May after it stops raining. And I take the top part of the cover crop off, all the tall stuff, right? The stuff that is consumptive, you know, that uses a lot more water. I'm listening to him and he goes, and I use a T-blade in that flail. I'm like, okay. And he goes, and six weeks later, eight weeks later, he goes, that thatch has fallen down, so it's protecting the soil. It's creating some, uh, a, you know, anaerobic, or it, it, it's producing an environment it's healthy for the underlying crops, like the clovers, the tree oils, uh, the, the radishes. And then he says, and I change that, the, the flail over, and I put a cup on there, and then I'm able to completely break down that cover crop. Because that was the problem, right? That's what everybody worries about during harvest. You know, what happens? Or, you know, if your watch starts watching me, you know, will they see the cover crop? And I think what we have to do is we have to understand first, What's the biological diversity? First, where are, what's the, the site-specific environment? What kind of soils, where am I? What kind of cover crop, winter cover crop should I plant? How should I plant it? And then how am I gonna terminate it so that I don't get penalized due to your watch, right? Or some type of uh, system. So again, those were kind of the challenges that, that I had. So we've been using cover crops. I'll finish the story with, with uh, uh, the exchange of ideas. So the RCD put together a field day, just like lunch and learn. And, and as, they, as you listen to growers and they talked about it, and you saw their enthusiasm and you know that there was a change, things started to, to make sense to me. And I said, okay, I've got to do this, right? So it's how I plant it, what I plant, and how I turn it. Um, See, get into this. Uh, so we just talked about you know healthy soils, and then I started thinking, okay, well I've got this cover crop. I'm increasing my my infiltration rate, and then you know we've got fertilizer constraints now, and all those things, and then you start talking about conversion of you know what healthy soils do, how it holds water. But I think the second thing, other than infiltration rate, was that in my fields all the water when I have a half inch of rain, goes to the end of it, and it just flows out of the back end of my, my our ranch and goes onto our neighbor trench, right? And that becomes a problem. So when I started planting these cover crops, all the water started to stay, and I was like, okay, well, I'm harvesting the rain, but more importantly, because I've opened up the soil, I'm starting to put that water back into the soil. And I think that's critical. I think that, you know, the one thing that we all know and like no other time in my lifetime 
and you know, I saw the 77 crowd. Um, water is a challenge, and it's going to be a challenge. And if we don't figure it out, it's going to be a really big problem. So everybody tells you, well, we're going to recharge, and we're going to do all this stuff. I get recharge, but when you have four inches of rain, there's not much capability of recharge, right? So the four inches of rain this year that came stayed on my ranch. And I think that's critical. I think that's one of the most important things that, so I call it rain harvesting, right? I always have little, little terms for what, what we do. And I think that that's, that's gonna be really, really important. Along with these other benefits, you know, um, nutrient utilization. I can go down the list, and I'm sure we'll go through them today, but I think that those are the things that, that, are, that are most important. Again, I think, you know, one of the things that I see, and I think what's the most important, and I love the fact that, that Silas said that he can put enough time in here for growers to talk to one another. And I would really encourage you to find people, you know, that have used cover crops and see where the, where the challenges are and where the opportunities are, what their history's been, and then what they've seen as outcomes. And I think that that is a game changer. As the RCD, um, you know, we see our the San Joaquin region. I, I don't, you know, when, when people talk about resilience and innovation, uh, what we're all trying to do is increase productivity and reduce inputs. My grandmother used to call it net profit, but whether you like the word or not, the new word sustainability, right? And I think that's an important thing. Is I think we have to have. We've got to figure out the resources we have, use them best, and then be able to farm to our highest ability. The San Joaquin Valley is the strongest growing region on the planet. And I don't know if you guys know this, but we produce 7% of the gross annual profit of U.S. agriculture. Is that, is that off the hook? That's seven, that's 7 million acres compared to the rest of the U.S. I mean, I think that that's phenomenal. And that is an important thing for us as farmers, for our state, for our country. I think those are things that are, are gonna be paramount uh, going into the future. Again, I'm around, love to talk to anybody, uh, but at the end of the day, this is an important subject. Uh, we'd like to see in the San Joaquin Valley in the next three years, a quarter million acres planted. Uh, we've had a lot of resistance uh, but there's a lot of research, and there's people talking. I mean, the researchers at UC and everywhere have been working really hard in the NRCS. You're going to hear Rob Roy talk about it. But have worked really, really hard to validate the importance of winter cover crops and how they aren't consumptive and how we can use them to, to get ourselves to the, to the future. So I appreciate your time and, and I look forward to talking to you. Thank you. He's actually someone that I dealt with at the NRCS um, just a few years ago. But he was a great wealth of knowledge and helping me understand all the different um, systems that needed to be looked at. Um, really a big picture. And if you get the chance, visit Rob about his history, what he's done. It's the man who's lived multiple um, lifespans in different areas. It's really a neat story. So Rob, it's always fun listening to you know, your experiences and what you've learned and different things. So I'm gonna let you talk about you know, what you've seen, uh, what you get to see, and some of the challenges ahead and some of the solutions that you see. So Rob, it's all yours. And then all right, thanks. So uh, yeah, my name is is uh, Rob Roy. I'm uh, an agronomist with uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service. I've been with the agency a little over 20 years now um, in this specific position as an agronomist for a little over a year, which is great, allows me to focus on things, uh, all things agronomic. And um, before coming to NRCS for about 15 years before that, I was a, a CCA, CCA in private industry. I worked for Borellis for a little while. Uh, also worked for a uh, family vineyard operation up on the Merced River in 
Livingston planted thousands of acres of cover crop. My boss's name is Julio. But anyway, um, so uh, I, uh, I'm happy to be here today just to give you a little talk on, uh, on some soil health issues, but I'm not really specifically going to talk as much about soil health as you, as you might usually hear. But uh, I want to focus on a couple issues that stem from soil health. And because of a discussion that Silas and Matt and I had a couple months ago about uh, these things, I'm going to focus on uh, two items that I think are challenges for, for all of you. One is uh, water, and the other one is uh, the price of fertilizer. And uh, when I worked for Wilbur Ellis, I was selling UN32 for 235 at the time, if I could get it, right? So, and, and those of you that bought UN32 paid quite a bit more for it this, this past year. And there's a little USDA graph showing you, you know, what happened uh, here in uh, 2021, and recently with, with the price of fertilizer, it went up substantially. So that's a challenge, it creates quite a challenge. So um, I want to preface my, uh, my comments here. Let's think about this for a minute. The, the human brain is, is this incredible pattern matching machine. We, we, you know, it's developed over the years that we are so good at seeing patterns in nature anywhere really that sometimes we see patterns that don't really exist. The same brain that recognized that the phases of the moon causes the tides also saw a pattern that has resulted in uh, astrology. Okay, so you see the irony there. But um, so along comes science which you know is, is uh, an open, observable, and repeatable process to, to document, you know, things that actually occur out there. So, I'm going to try to, in this talk, you know, incorporate some of the, just the pattern things that we see, plus some of the science. All the while realizing that an old farmer that I was trying to sell UN32 to one day mentioned to me that, you know, he didn't really need the science to keep doing what he was doing. He'd been farming for 50 years, and he was very right. So, so I'm going to try and achieve a balance here on, on some of this information. Uh, and again, focus on you know nitrogen supply and nitrogen contributions in forms other than inorganic nitrogen. And you know, there's a lot of statistics out there. Um, this is from plant and soil journal, as much as 50% of the nitrogen applied is not used by the crop, right? All you have to do is walk across a field that just had an anhydrous application. And if you've ever done that, you, you, you tell that a lot of that nitrogen is escaping uh, into the atmosphere. So uh, what I want to do is try to advance understanding here of nitrogen contribution in forms other than things like anhydrous and uh, UN32 are inorganic. So, in our, in our soils, uh, there's this thing going on with soil health, and you can see some of these concepts in the tunnel that we have set up out there. If you get a chance, please go and look at that. It's not a bounce house, so no jumping on it. It's meant to go inside and, and look at, but um, soil nutrients generally occur in two forms, inorganic compounds and then uh, which are our, our nitrate and our ammonium, and then organic compounds where the nitrogen is tied up into uh, organic matter, into uh, microorganisms and that sort of thing. And as those microorganisms break down carbonaceous and other organic materials to, to decay them, they, they take them up into their, into their, uh, their body stored in these, these soil organisms. And uh, we call that, um, you know, it, it, it ties up the nutrients. Whereas when these organisms start to break down and excrete uh, nitrogen, uh, 
uh, we call that mineralization. So there's this constant thing going on in the soil where nitrogen is being tied up uh, and stored and then other times it's being released. And there's a lot of factors that, that uh, influence that. And here's a couple of examples for you of that. Uh, a soil with soil organic matter content of 2%, 2% organic matter, contains about 3,500 pounds of nitrogen per acre at the top foot of the profile. It's total nitrogen. That's a boatload of nitrogen. Okay, but you know, it's not all boom, readily available. Generally about 1 to 3% is mineralized during the growing season. So, you know, you can make a rough estimate that if you had a soil with organic matter of 2% and all the right conditions occur, you might get between 35 and 105 pounds of nitrogen per acre in that 2% of soil organic matter. And uh, a lot of factors influence that, including temperature. Okay? And um, this is just some SIMIS data that shows changes in soil temperature. And, and uh, you know, keep in mind those numbers I just gave you during the growing season. This is the total year, but of course the growing season is, you know, a portion of this. So you can see how the soil temperatures vary from, you know, 50 degrees, a little bit less, upwards close to 80 degrees, depending on, you know, how far north you are, how far south, how far south you are. Uh, Fresno State being the most southern here, uh, you know, that temperature really gets up there in the, in the summertime. And then uh, this is an estimate of, based on that soil temperature increase of the amount of nitrogen that's mineralized from that soil organic matter uh, every month. And you, you know, you can see that in uh, you know, June and July and August, we're getting upwards of, you know, 20 pounds per acre per month, again, from soil with 2% organic matter. Theoretically, with all the right conditions and a healthy soil, it could be a pretty significant uh, contribution of nitrogen to your soils. Uh, if you have a vineyard, you know, uh, sometimes that's enough. Right? So we call that plant available nitrogen. And uh, just a little bit more uh, information here uh, coming from uh, the National Center for Appropriate Technology, or NCAT, uh, just to introduce the concept of cover crops and or green manures providing that nitrogen and organic matter to the soil. We know that uh, cover crops add, can add organic matter and, uh, to the soil, and that is a substantial source of that uh, uh, soil organic matter. And uh, of course, how you manage that cover crop is very important too. This is, a, this is a little bit of a busy slide. I've got a couple of busy slides here. I'm gonna try and, and, uh, and uh, let you see what's going on here. And, and this is from data from Oregon State University. And what it's showing us here is the plant available nitrogen from the cover crop depending on when you terminate it. And, what this is showing you is it's something like a cereal. If you uh, terminate a uh, 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 cereal cover crop, you know, early on, before it starts to get into the boot stage, you can actually release a little bit of nitrogen because it's taking it up in cycles. Okay? But once you know, it gets into this later stage, you're not going to get quite as much nitrogen from it as plant available nitrogen in that same season, as opposed to legumes. Um, you know, once they start to get into this uh, vegetative growth stage and get all that growth and they're fixing nitrogen and most of that nitrogen that a cover crop has is tied up above ground. And so you can see that that termination and, and getting it back into the soil is, is the greatest uh, right up until about the bud stage. Uh, if you have a pure legume cover crop, you're going to get it the most theoretically you know, upwards of more than 80 pounds per acre. And, uh, you know, if it's only 25% legume and some cereal, you're only going to get, uh, you're going to get a little bit less. So it depends on the amount of legumes that are in that cover crop. 
And uh, here's an example from the Pacific Northwest uh, Extension publication where uh, they attempted to measure the, uh, the amount of nitrogen that came from the cover crop. Uh, and of course, what they did was they, they, they grew the cover crop, uh, then they flail molded, molded, and then they tilled it to incorporate it. Of course, not everybody tills their cover crop. Sometimes you just, you just shred it and leave it on the surface. But what they, they attempted to answer the question here, what is the organic and fertilizer replacement value of the vetch and oak winter cover crops. And um, so they planted these cover crops, uh, a veg cover crop, and then uh, a grain cover crop, an oats. And then they also applied these different rates of fertilizer. And you notice these, these four different rates go up by 90 pounds of, of, of nitrogen per acre in, in four different treatments. And the reason they do it in that manner is to create a linear uh, what they call regression in statistics in, in universities. They use that to, to make determinations about the research. And the results, and I'm going to show you a real busy graph in just a second here, but the, the result was that the bench cover crop replaced about 110 pounds of feather meal and nitrogen per acre to get that same yield of broccoli. So, uh, and again, I realize this is a pretty busy uh, uh, graph here, but if you kind of focus on this one right here, what you see is two lines, right? And these are regressions because of the different levels and drawing the lines between them. And what you see here is, um, this is uh, the broccoli yield uh, where the veg cover crop was, and this is the broccoli yield where there was no cover crop. And what it's showing you was that this yield of five tons per acre of broccoli was uh, with the veg cover crop was achieved with only about you know 60 pounds of nitrogen from the feather meal, whereas no cover crop they had to put about 175 uh, uh, pounds of, of nitrogen on to get that same five ton yield. So that's where that you know that uh, 100 uh, pounds of nitrogen placement from the cover crop to get that same yield came from. That's their statistical analysis. And then over here was something similar with, uh, with oats, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving here. So you, you, know, you work all that stuff into the ground, and it starts to break down. The saprophytes and microorganisms go to work on it. They tie some of it up. They release some of the nitrogen. And how long does that really take once you put it into the ground. Well, um, this is uh, from uh, some, some references down here, Work Technology uh, uh, Journal, and uh, you can see on the x at, uh, y axis here, the rate of mineralization, the general rate of that uh, mineralization or crop in uptake, um, comparing it to the, the, the cover crop when it's incorporated back here at day zero. Uh, and then the mineralization increases, increases. Obviously, the temperature's right. You've got the right soil, soil with more microorganisms. Uh, it takes uh, about four weeks from the cover crop incorporation to the right conditions for you to get the maximum mineralization of that nitrogen from that cover crop. And then, you know, if you can time it right, and this is our crop demand right here, as our crop demand starts to increase, well, that nitrogen is available there. So timing is, can, can really be important to incorporate the cover crop to get it there, make it available at the time of maximum demand. How many almond growers do we have? Got a few. Any broccoli growers? <coughs> well, uh, yeah, from the uh, Fertilizer Research and Education Program, you know, here's our uh, seasonal end uptake. For, for almonds, and uh, you know, it really starts to occur a little bit after bloom, right about fruit set. Uh, the total in the almond trees really starts to increase uh, about uh, right after fruit set, say 90 days, this is January 1st back here, so 30, 60, 90, the end of March, it starts to, uh, almonds start to take it up, really maximizing the almond nitrogen uptake at, at about 180. Days, so uh, six months in, you're 
you really start to take up a lot of nitrogen in your almonds. So, you know, you would want that uh, cover crop to be incorporated again about four weeks prior to that in order to get that maximum nitrogen in your almonds from the cover crop. Uh, and of course, some people use tillage to incorporate the cover crop. A lot of, a lot of folks don't till their almond orchards at all. But no-till, um, you know, both will get nitrogen into the soil. I think the jury is out on the, you know, how, how well that works. Uh, obviously, leaving uh, a high nitrogen cover crop shredded on the surface, you're going to get some, some nitrogen loss just into the atmosphere, but um, you, you still will get some. And, and of course, this is the interesting part: is that you know you can estimate the above from the above ground biomass and the growth stage how much nitrogen is contributed. We have calculations to, to do that. So, um, uh, based on the, the amount of, of cover crop you get and, and what amount of nitrogen that will contribute, we can actually calculate that for you. And uh, here's, a, here's an example close to home, uh, Tom and Dan Rogers, uh, they, uh, they started using these soil health practices, uh, the increase of yield, and uh, he was doing mulching, composting, and some conservation cover, and uh, he uh, increasing his microbial activity with those cover crops, and he felt that, you know, that added about 50 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, per acre every year, and, and, he, and he never eliminated his potassium purchases uh, as well. And he also used regular soil and leaf tissue sampling, a really critical part of uh, your nitrogen management. But uh, uh, good success story there for uh, Tom and Dan Rogers. So uh, I want to shift now from plant available nitrogen plant available water, which is another challenge that all of you are, are facing. So uh, let's talk a little bit about available water in your soils, or your orchard, your vineyard, or wherever you may be growing, and, and how cover crops, organic matter, can, can influence that. And um, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, those of you that grow almonds, how deep are your roots? Anybody know how deep your almond roots go? Well, they go down a ways. I know vineyard uh, vineyards do as well. You know, if you look at a lot of the, the data from the California Almond Board, they, they tell us that a large part, up to some seventy percent of the the actual roots, and remember, roots are constantly dying and, and re, reforming, uh, are in the top foot, foot and a half of your soil. And But there are things that can really improve and get those roots down deeper, right? And there are things that can prevent the roots from getting down deeper, too. So, um, and that can be really critical to how much water gets to your trees you want your vines. You know, keep in mind, this is one of these little statistics from, uh, from one of our uh, NRCS uh, publications here, uh, where I got this, is that organic matter increases the available water capacity. Each 1% of organic matter adds about 1.5% of the available water capacity. And, and some of you have probably seen these, uh, these tables before, looking at the different texture of soils and the available water, and then the readily available water, which is about half of, of what's actually available to get to the permanent wilting point, you don't want to get down to that point. But if you look at something like a, a loam, you can have readily available water of you know, about uh, two inches uh, in that two foot root depth. And then uh, you take a, a sandy loam, you get you know, one to one and a half uh, inches of water in that, in that two foot uh, depth available water. Uh, assuming your roots are getting to it, right? So, you know, consider uh, your, your situation here with your, your trees and your plants or whatever, and in this case we have a loam here with a, uh, a physical barrier down at about 18 inches, some kind of compacted 
flare, sometimes impervious flare. Oftentimes, it will stop your roots. I, you know, I've actually seen situations with almond orchards where, and, and I know you all experience this when the wind blows. You know, it can cost you a bunch of money because your trees blow. Over, right? Some of your trees are always blowing over. I've actually worked with growers that had trees blowing over, and we converted the cover crop, and that compacted layer and what was going on there in their soil was eventually eliminated and they quit using, losing so many trees because the roots were actually deeper and were able to hold on to the soil better and there was, there was actually fewer trees to grow over. It was one of those startling differences. Maybe just a pattern in our minds like I was mentioning before but it, it seemed to make sense. But anyway, if you consider these two soils, this loam with this physical barrier at about 18 inches versus a sandy loam here with no physical barrier. If you consider that uh, that soil with that root barrier at 18 inches, and it, you know, from that previous table, having that uh, available water fraction of two inches per foot available, uh, that's only uh, about three inches of available water at, at, with, a, with a root barrier of 18 inches. Because first of all, your roots are not going any deeper Probably your water is not either. Okay. But you know, consider this soil over here with actually a lower available water fraction. It's a sandy loam, one and a half inches per foot compared to two up here, but with a depth of 48 inches. Okay. Now you have six inches of available water. So just a, an example of how improving where your roots go and uh, using cover crops to get rid of that impervious layer really improve the amount of water that's available to your crop. And uh, here's an example of uh, uh, Chris Wishwain. Wishwain, uh, and this is from the California Almond Corps, it's on their website, uh, who uses cover crops in, uh, in this uh, 150 acre orchard near Manteca. Uh, their goal was to reduce soil compaction by improving the orchard's water retention, allowing the roots of their trees to penetrate deeper into the soil and obtain water, and it, it was very successful for them. So again, just another example of, of, of how that, that can help you and has helped uh, this grower in particular. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and again, remember what I'm trying to do here, I'm throwing you a bunch of data up here. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, groups, uh, groundwater sustainability uh, agencies that are making decisions and will make decisions about, uh, you know, how much water you're going to be allowed to use, what the impact of you using a cover crop might be, and, you know, we've been rolling this information out to try to inform their decision-making process, and, and I'm, I'm trying to throw a bunch of information out to, to demonstrate that there really is a lot of information out there scientific data plus you know, observations from growers that having improved organic matter in cover crops actually doesn't use a lot more water if it's done correctly. It can actually improve your water status and in many cases break even, which I'm going to continue to show you. And this is another one of those another one of those tables just showing that the soil water that's available uh, as the organic matter increases uh, uh, the available water increases as your soil organic matter uh, increases. So, again, just, just some more data that's out there. Um, so, keep moving along here. Uh, cultivation of your soil is also one thing that uh, can destroy organic matter. Uh, when, we, when we do cultivate our soil, and I realize sometimes we have to, uh, it can uh, decrease water infiltration and storage. It can biological activity, adversity, uh, it can decrease the efficient nutrient cycling, actually raise summer temperatures of the soil. I'm going to show you some data on that in, in, in a second. So, um, you know, these are all problems that we often cause by excessive tillage. And I realize sometimes you have to till, you have to till, you're going to, but, but you know, keep these things in mind. Like Silas was saying, let's learn, you know, open our minds to some of these things. Uh, and why maximize soil recovery? Because it helps with infiltration. Uh, it can actually decrease evaporation uh, from the soil with 
recovering the soil, uh, uh, moderating the soil temperatures, improving the habitat for soil organisms, the food for those, those microorganisms, just really uh, improving the organic matter and the soil and improving its water holding potential. Uh, and then, so this is one of the most famous studies that's out there. You guys are familiar with some of you, Jeff Mitchell, and uh, he uh, uh, has, has, I think this is going to come out here in a month or so in California Agriculture Magazine. But uh, this was a study he did with uh, Alyssa DeVincentis and uh, some other folks, uh, Danielle Zachariah and, uh, uh, and Jeff Mitchell. And they did this study in uh, processing tomato fields, cover crop, and, and uh, almond orchard cover crop, and free uh, native vegetation. And um, it's, uh, it's available in, oh, actually it came out, uh, it already came out in California. State. But anyway, again, what is the impact of winter cover crop on soil moisture? Does it really use extra moisture? And their, their research clearly showed that winter cover crops in the Central Valley generally are great even in terms of actually consumptive quantities. So this is a recent study that Jeff pulled out this year. And, uh, really demonstrates that there were not significant differences in soil moisture between cover crop and control fields as far as you know, how much water was, was available there. Didn't really actually use any extra water in the net situation. There's other work uh, too. Uh, some of you are familiar with Larry Williams. Uh, done a lot of research at the University of California. Uh, Larry Williams tends to write papers that are very difficult to understand. And so, George Wong, our uh, Fresno Bid Farm Advisor, helped me interpret this one, but he, uh, he definitely found that uh, in, in lysimeter trials, that soil evaporation accounted for 15% of the total vineyard water use, right? Uncovered soil, not covered by a cover crop, 15% of the water use was actually just evaporated from the soil. Uh, Christine Jefferly, Faith Home Orchard here, uh, she learned that she could reduce her water use in early spring because the soil was not drying out as quickly as in the past. And uh, again, uh, you know, actually a case study, uh, Faith Home Orchard, California. And uh, something from, from the coast, uh, by Fritz Westover, a viticulturalist, and found that these findings suggest the presence of a grass cover crop in a vineyard middle during the winter and spring months does not necessarily increase the necessary quantity of water that must be supplied to mine through irrigation. So there's you know there's quite a bit of research out there. And, and uh, one other study uh, with uh, some of you may have heard of Con Kutral. He gives presentations here at the Central Valley. And again, um, this is from the Society of Technology and Viticulture. They, they showed that grass under no-till situations in a vineyard actually preserved plant available water in the soil because we got more water in. We harvested the rain, as Matt was saying. Uh, we covered the soil surface so it didn't get as hot. There wasn't as much evaporation. So it really can work. So that's it. Thank you all very much. I hope, uh, hope that all makes sense. To prove the theory and the concept of what we're talking about today and I think if you guys want to see more of those things we'll share some of those slides we'll share those studies because for you guys if you want to go down those rabbit holes and be able to really get in depth like uh, Rob was saying sometimes you need someone to translate all that stuff totally understand but that's why we're here that's what we do is California Ag Solutions we take discovery research and bring it to grower results and it's such a critical thing because Real easily, we can get lost, confused with all this stuff, but our goal is to really help take all this great science, all the hard work that these guys are doing, because it's getting to know these researchers and what their passion is, is amazing. It's just how do we put it into practice on a large commercial scale, because that's what really what we're about. It's great when we're doing it in little test plots, but how do we make it replicate over thousands and millions of acres? That's huge. Sure. Uh, thanks, Silas. I just want to uh, acknowledge some of my colleagues that are here. Um, 
Kareem uh, Adoliki is an agronomist from Hanford, and uh, and you know feel free to talk to Kareem. Um, and, and Kareem's kind of manning the soil tunnel out here. Join me today. And then uh, Dana Marie and Taylor from the Madeira NRCS office, also my colleagues there, I want to talk to you about any of the NRCS programs. Um, they'd be happy to work with you. So I just want to acknowledge their, their presence here and thank them for coming. Thank you, Rob. Um, so up next, we have our very own Justin Dutra. So he is a PCA and a bunch of other cool things that he gets to do here, right? Yes. So Justin, it's all yours. Thank you. So I'm here to talk about IPM effects with the cover cropping system. So here's some of my experience. Um, experience just means I've learned a lot from my mistakes. Um, we've got a lot of experience in this room, so please talk with each other on the breaks and, and learn from each other's experiences. Um, I was an in-house agronomist for a large farm on the west side for 10 years. Um, I'm a recovering retail PCA, and uh, now I'm going on two years as a, I always have a problem with this word, regenerative. So I said it right that time, but five syllable, syllable words I have issues with, but yes, going into soil health, anything I can do to improve that soil health is going to help me with my IPM programs. So here's a system comparison. Natural ecosystems are diverse, they're usually minimal management, and they're resilient. Our agro systems that we have now, most conventional systems, are monocultures, they're intensively managed, and they're vulnerable. So my goal is to, I, I want more of a natural ecosystem to manage. You know, that, that sure sounds like a lot less work than this, and a lot less intense. This is complex, but I'd much rather manage that type of ecosystem on the farm. So how can we gain resiliency? So planting multi-species pepper crops. This creates additional habitat for our beneficials, improves infiltration for better crop health and water efficiency. If you have phytophthora issues in your fields, you've got standing water, you've got anaerobic conditions, plant a cover crop. It'll open up that ground and you'll have less disease pressure too. Anywhere I plant that cover crop, I have less weed pressure. I'd rather plant those seeds than let the flea beans and the jungle rice and all these tough to control weeds that you know I just have to spend a lot of money on for herbicide to control. I'd rather plant these and manage that with the mower. So lessons are needed for pesticides. Improves the efficiencies of our nutrient applications. Believe it or not, I want you to use less fertilizer. You know, if I'm doing things right with the soil health, you know, I don't have to apply as much fertilizer. So IPM, what does it stand for? Integrated pesticide management, integrated pest management, or impatient people creating mayhem. So it's integrated pest management. So here's the long definition that's on the UC IPM website. So just look at it as you have techniques like biological control, habitat manipulation, cultural practices, and your last resort is using a pesticide. That should always be your last thing that you need to use when you pull the trigger to use a pesticide. So I am, my definition is a system approach to pest management. So how can we implement a successful IPM system? Biological control. If it wasn't for the naturally occurring bio biological controls in your fields, you'd be spraying every day. So just think about that. Like, how long could you stay in business if it wasn't for the natural, naturally occurring biocontrols? So your predators, your beneficials, um, we need to help them in the system instead of work against them. Uh, habitat manipulation, there again, cover crops, you're diversifying that crop mix. So you have a monoculture, a pistachio field, an almond field, a cotton field, that is your monoculture. To, to add resiliency is crop rotation. Well, how do you crop rotate in a perennial system? 
That's the cover crops. That's your cover crop in your middles. Plant a multi-species cover crop. That's going to add to your diversity. That's going to add to your resiliency of your cash crop. So cultural practices, more and more I see, the less tillage I do, the less I'm going to screw up my ground. Leave it alone if you can. Every now and then you do need to run something, but you know, more and more I'm seeing, the less tillage I do. I'd rather have a cover crop providing tillage roots, opening up that soil, working 24-7, a biological source, you know, that's working for me, than going to get on a ripper and, you know, spending all that money and time and root pruning and all the, the disadvantages of doing that. But yeah, sometimes you do have to do it, but let's try not to do it again after we get the ground right. So weed management, back to, I'm, I'm sowing the seeds that I want to grow, otherwise you end up with the ones that you don't. I, I, I absolutely hate writing up wrecks for full width sprays because I've got flea bean, I've got jungle rice, I've got, you name the weed that's tough to control that Roundup won't touch, I've got it. Because that, those are the weeds that we're left with now because we've literally just burned out the Roundup. And those herbicides that we have now are not cheap. So I'd much rather plant that cover crop and manage that with the mower and have that spray rig on there. Among the other things, worrying about drift, worrying about over application, you name it. So um, plant the seeds you want to grow. So excellent habitat for natural enemies. So I'm a bug nerd, so I, uh, at this little video supported by not just a commercial a partnership between national what's happening and is these new technologies are helping scientists system. to understand the rivers that supply what here in the southeastern united so, states these are the monocrop plants and actually out a signature that acres are attracted to they're blowing up so then that's going to put out a signature for the parasitoids that are going to go after those aphids. Because wasps are known as aphid killers. And some aphids are busily so sucking they're tiny wasps. on these plants. Now, the they, plants they're on our side. They're helping us merely to kill the aphids. become more profitable that would be by just easy. doing what nature intended. Like a character in a James Bond movie, the wasp has a more exquisite... So I want to do the, the most I can to support this biology in my field instead of, wasp a you know, into each body. broad spectrum this pesticides, you name it. I want to encourage that habitat the for these parasitoids and beneficials so they can help with the pest management. They're working day and night. they got a living organism working for me, not just a... The judge and the that I've got to buy it. But it's too late. The wasp has done its work. Hasta la vista, baby. And we mean baby. The so those are all mummies. That's how I can tell I've got parasitism going on. And then that's, that wasp is developing inside. This is going on every day in our field. So how, what can we do to support this? Instead of working against it, let's work with it. The young wasp emerging to seek out more aphids to begin this cycle all over again. The wasp, with its exquisite. There's one species. There's countless species of beneficials working for us. So, what, what can we do, Mike? So, we got predaceous mites, they're controlling the spider mites, the pest mites, and I can spray less. It, it probably saved me a miticide at least. So the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting a different result. This guy is doing the same thing over again. He's getting knocked on his rear. So let's let's change. Let's let's do something different. If you're not happy with the way things are going on your farm, you know we need to look at it and say what can we adjust? What what do we need to do different um, so we don't keep getting knocked on our rear? So CS is your trusted guide for plant nutrition, IPM, water systems efficiency, soil health, cover crops, and solutions. You've got a problem, I will help you find a solution. We will help you find a solution. That's, that's 
to God. And I love that part of it. Here's one of our cover crop planters. This was in the Hanford area last fall, winter time, and pistachios. They had just did their compost and jet, and then I just drilled right on top of it. So I like big iron. I grew up on a farm. Any, any time I was around equipment, you know, it was always impressive. But you know what's not impressive is that payment. So that top picture, probably over 750 grand right there. So that tractor and that ripper, and imagine he's probably burning 30 to 35 gallons of diesel an hour. So I'd rather do that tractor down below, you know, 50, 60 grand for the drill and the, and the tractor that you probably have on your farm already and use the cover crops to open up that ground instead of, you know, big payment on top. Thank you. Any, any questions? This is what I've been hearing about and never seeing in person. You know, when you hear something, that's one thing. When you see it for yourself, that's like that. Oh, okay. This is how this all works together. This is just one little benefit of doing pepper crops. It's less, less my pressure. Right, so when you're planting a diverse multi-species cover crop, you don't have that signature of that single crop that's putting out there and you get a flood of aphid or you get a flood of stink bug. You don't because it's diverse, it's almost like camouflage. So you get some pests in there, but you're also getting the beneficials too. And what, what I've seen is, you know, um, just much better situation because of the, the multi-species we're doing and not seeing the blow-ups of the stink bugs. I have more predators. They're feeding on those stink bug eggs and, and uh, parasitizing and, and generalist predators, assassin bugs, you name it. So in general, I've seen definitely positive results on before, yes, I had those fears. It's like, hey, am I creating habitat for the bad bugs? Well, not really. I, I, I've got a habitat for the, the good bugs, too. So it kind of all works together. You'll see results the first year, you know, improvements, and it only starts compounding on, on itself every year. So, the best thing you can do is get started. Thank you, everybody. what I have experienced, even for myself. I love being uh, told I'm wrong or find out that I didn't know something that I thought I knew. So I want you guys to kind of understand my goal with this is I want you guys to see the experience I have had, uh, customers have had, things that I've seen other people do, um, and keep a very open mind because this is just the beginning of this uh, path for all of us to understand cover crops better. As more and more of us are doing this, as Matt talked about earlier today, as we hit that quarter million acre mark of cover crops, imagine how many different situations, how many different creative um, solutions will come that we have never thought of in the past. So the more people that do these operations, the more creativity we will actually see. Um, I know some of you have maybe heard of this concept, the law of innovation and diffusion, is we all sit on this bell curve somewhere. If you look at innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, the laggards, um, let's just use our cell phone for an example. Who has a smartphone? Okay, most everybody here, who still has the good old flip phones? And who does not even have a cell phone? That idea of a cell phone puts us in all these different areas. Imagine if you're someone who can't wait to get the next iPhone 14 plus S, 15, whatever it might be coming up next, and you're willing to wait in line for quite a few hours just to get it when it first comes out, you're probably in that 2%, 2.5% of innovators. If you're someone that's willing to wait maybe a day or two 
but still wants the new iPhone because you see features in it that you might really be able to implement into your life, you're probably part of the early adopters. Now, if you just saw your neighbor get one and you're like, oh man, they've been taking some great pictures and I want to have posts just as good as them, you're probably part of the early majority. If you're taking your kid's cell phone and using that as your own cell phone after they've gotten to use it, you're, you're starting to become the late majority. If you don't even have the cell phone, if you still have a flip phone, most likely you're still in the that category. Regardless of where we sit on that, I want you guys to think about the cover crop as an idea of where we sit here. Because the really important thing is, those of us who are willing to try new things, willing to innovate, and willing to fail, are going to be getting the most out of the benefits that cover crops can offer. If we're too cautious and we don't want to try cover crops because we've heard of a failure or we've seen somebody else that has a bad experience, you're missing out on the opportunity to perfect it for your operation. So today what I, my goal is is to be able to show you guys by innovating, by trying things on small scales, understanding your context that you farm in, really in working with somebody who knows how to manage a cover crop that's had experience, you will really minimize the train wrecks. And that's really what we're here for. That's what California Ag Solutions focuses on. If you take one thing away from today, we help you prevent train wrecks. We don't want you to lose money. We don't want you to spend a wasted amount of money on things. Our goal is to help you be very cost conscious and aware of what these expenses are so that you can improve your net revenue. Pretty simple, right? So just remember this graph, this bell curve, where you sit because innovation will bring on a lot more creativity. So really the first step when I look at all of this is in order to really start this journey, whether regardless of how much experience you've had in all of this, you need to find somebody who's had experience doing this. Find the guy, right? If you look at all of the different experiences, uh, a lot of major movies, a lot of great stories, they always have a guide that helps the hero, help someone reach or obtain a certain goal that seems otherwise maybe insurmountable, very difficult to do. So find someone who has experience. We have a lot of experience doing that, and we'd love to be able to help you become a hero, a high efficiency resource operator. Now, I stole that term from Matt Angel a while ago because when he was talking about high efficiency resource operator, that's essentially people, all of us, working with limited resources. But how do we make this limited resource, like water, for example, or good soil, or revenue for that matter, how do we get more out of it? How do we stretch that? How do we maximize the opportunity and really look at how can we do a better job with being and optimizing, essentially, with the work that I was looking at. Um, trying to find those opportunities to do better, that's what a hero is, looking for opportunities. Second step, this is probably one of the most important parts of the whole process, is understanding and knowing your context. So when I say context, most of you your mind should go to understanding the limitations or limiting factors that our environment provides. Well, where do we all live? Pretty much in a desert, right? We get very little rain, and for the last few years, we've gotten very little rain. So imagining growing you know, crops without rain, like corn and soybeans with no irrigation, right? That must be awesome. Just say, hey, we're gonna get three inches of rain in the next few days. We get that, we get super excited. But understanding our moisture is very, very critical to be able to manage a cover crop. If we're not gonna get a whole lot of rain, that's all right. We also get to see the effects of very little rain. But we're also planting multi-species cover crops that are very resilient to drought. One of the things I want you guys to see in this picture is this is the exact same seed mix, planted at roughly the exact same time in each year, but that's 2001 compared to 2022. Look at how much of a difference we have between this one. So this one was planted um, last December. Remember all the rains we had around Christmas time? It was phenomenal, wasn't it? It was amazing. Guess what happened after that? Nothing. We have 45 to 48 days of zero precipitation during the month of January and very little in February. So that's a challenge, right? But the year before, we had normal-ish rain. 
where we actually would get a half an inch to an inch and it would spread out. So this wasn't irrigated. That is all based on rainwater. That is not. Similar soil types, exact same cover crop plant, similar planting times throughout the year. These are things that are outside of our control, but planting multi-species really improves the resiliency or the ability to deal with drought conditions. If we're planting a single or two species, that's a lot more difficult because you're not necessarily always going to get the same results. If you plant it just the right time, maybe all those seeds come up, they need a certain amount of water, they love to have very consistent patterns. By having a large amount of seeds, and we're talking anywhere from 10 to 18, and some people plant even more species than that, but multi-species means 10 to 18 different types of species. Now, a little bit later, we'll go into the different categories, kind of like the four major food groups, but the major four types of species of cover crops that we, the seeds that we are planting. But this is really important to remember, is Take a picture of that in your mind and remember how much rain makes a difference. But that shouldn't stop you because guess what, when we planted this, we had no idea what the weather was going to be. But I can tell you, the soil benefited from both of these cover crops. So if you have a crystal ball, great, use it, but guess what, it's not going to be that accurate all the time. Um, step three, this is one of the most fun things that I get to see with most everybody, is planning with the end in mind. How are you going to terminate this cover crop? That makes a huge difference on what species you're going to be planting, how you're going to manage it, the types of equipment you will need to manage this cover crop throughout the growing season. What kind of mowers are you going to need? Are you going to spray it? Are you going to bale it, graze it? What is going to be your plan? This situation, we're actually baling cover crop in mature almond trees and then selling the bales. Another revenue stream, right? But that is something really interesting. If there's a will, there's a way. I have all the other pictures of uh, the equipment that was used. So if you guys want to see that, that's a really interesting way to do this. Um, but it takes planning, right? It wasn't one of those things last second. It's like, hey, let's try this. These things take foresight. It takes the ability to think about what do I want to do with this? Now, we can always call audibles, but I'm trying to prevent train wrecks, right? So if I go into this planning something, it helps me understand how I'm going to move into that next step. Now, with that, you obviously noticed that's a bale. There's a lot of carbon in that. This is so important for everybody to understand. This is probably out of planning, planning for a cover crop. This is critical in how we make seed plants. So California Ag Solutions provides the seed in order, in the right ratios, the right uh, species, that will make the biggest benefit and improve the outcome. Most failures that I see with the cover crops, specifically in almonds, are when people have too limited, like too little diversity. They have maybe two, three, four different types of cover crops in there, and it's usually heavy on grass. So, the barleys, the wheats, the rye, that's usually what makes a big chunk of this cover crop makes that causes a failure. And the reason why that happens is grasses create a tremendous amount of carbon, which isn't a bad thing, that's a great thing. But to manage all of that straw, that stubble, really affects how that cover crop will decompose. How will you actually move on with your nutrients? So if you look at it, nutrient immobilization or nutrient cycling. If we have a tremendous amount of a cover crop residue left, mainly from cereals, straw, wheats, all those kind of things, that's gonna require a tremendous amount of nitrogen to break it down. And the ideal ratio that microbes love is 24 parts of carbon to one part nitrogen. That is the main thing that we focus on when we make a cover crop seed. There's the four major groups, right? There's legumes, there's grasses, there's brassicas, and there's broadleaves. Here in a few slides, I'll go through some of the details of that, but legumes are extremely high in nitrogen, plus their root nodule, nodules add nitrogen to the soil. But what I'm looking at is the top biomass, everything that's above the ground, and what that nitrogen content is. When you look at a lot of these grasses, and a lot of the legumes, and a lot of these plant species, when they're in their uh, vegetative state, 
they are four to five, six percent nitrogen when you do an analysis of what that um, biomass is. As it changes into flour and as it produces into a seed, the nitrogen drops significantly. All of that energy is now being put into starch or the energy of that seed. That carbon to nitrogen ratio in the plant itself completely changes. So we time everything with that maturity of the cover crop. That's why we want to mow or we want to terminate at different times. We don't just feel like, oh cool, it's gotten huge, I want to get it six feet, eight feet. That's great. We also have to understand you're accumulating a lot of carbon. And if you don't have the nitrogen, the legumes and other means of getting nitrogen into that mix, it is going to make decomposing and getting rid of that uh, cover crop, specifically for almonds, a huge challenge. And I'll show you guys a little bit of pictures um, of what happens when you don't have much legumes in there and how, what you got to deal with. But on this chart, this is kind of where everything sits, right? So imagine this is just something that's like the Rosetta Stone. It helps you understand all the different commodities or different crops, the different things that we put on our fields and where those carbon-nitrogen ratios are. Because really what we're looking at is we're making a diet for microbes. Think about microbes as your most effective managers, your most effective employees that are destroying and decomposing all of this biomass and turning it into something useful. They turn all of this into plant-available nutrients, plant-available energy, but we have to do some work as far as planning ahead, making sure that we've got the right ratios. So if I'm getting a whole bunch of cereal, cereals in my cover crop, so wheat straw, oat straw, rye, those have like 80, 70 to 1. Well, what do microbes love? 24 to 1. So I have really got to supplement nitrogen. If I don't supplement nitrogen, guess what's happening in my system? I'm stealing nitrogen out of the soil system, and Rob talked about this. I'm stealing nitrogen out of the soil and giving it to the microbes. Because guess who eats first before a tree does? Microbes. If I don't have the right nitrogen, form and the right amounts, those microbes are going to steal nitrogen away from what otherwise would be going to a tree. And those microbes aren't necessarily always very uh, cooperative in sharing. They will make sure that they eat first, and then you're going to see nutrient deficiencies, we say in this instance, nitrogen. You can create a nitrogen deficiency and wonder, man, that cover crop, why are my trees slowing down? Well, it's because there wasn't the right planning and what the right variety should be. And that's something that we can help you with. We see that, and we see a lot of different variations in the soil types and the timing. So we can make that really easy. It might sound complicated, it might be overwhelming. It's like, wow, carbon, nitrogen, C, colon, N, whatever this is. We can make this a lot more simple um, by looking at your field and showing you what we've done and experience with that. Um, this is really important because this changes how you manage cover crops. And the easy way to manage that is not only with the right ratio, but how we mow it. Now, Matt mentioned a little bit about like Rob Chu and the timing um, with his mowers and the different blades on his flail mowers. That is extremely simple to do, and it is the most effective way to change that plant's growth stage. Remember, young plants that are in their rapid growth or that vegetative state, extremely high in nitrogen, right? That's what we're looking for. So we manage that with height. So if something's growing too fast and we have a crazy amount of rain, we might want to get a rotary mower, like you know those brush hogs or the John Deere's, or like a giant lawn mower. You might want to go through that really quick. Or, even easier, you get to have an old ring roller, run that ring roller over a lot of those taller species, specifically brassicas, that it breaks them, stops their growth pattern, and it changes. Now, guess what? We have all these other species, specifically legumes, that just start popping through there like crazy. Then, when you mow next time, that really improves the nitrogen content, and then that, when you mow, all that nitrogen is now sitting on top of a high carbon plant or helps it decompose. So, timing is everything, and that's, we enjoy helping you every step of the way to be able to improve how this works. Um, the types of blades on mowers is also critical. Um, the little details like that, we can go over all that with you at the time, but honestly, try not to remember everything here. You can, that's amazing, I'm glad you can, but realistically, most of our minds aren't capable of memorizing every single one, every single detail here. 
but just remember, we are here to help you guys every step along the way. Now, I mentioned the four different species, right? There's four major groups. Now, within each one, there's a lot of different species. So, here, these are just some of the cool season legumes that we work with. Now, you can kind of see all the different categories. If you have amazing eyes, then you can kind of see what each one of these um, little green or yellow red blocks are. But just know that we are purposely designing and picking the right cover crop for your soil condition, the right growing situation, and we're essentially making an amazing meal for your microbes and your trees. Right? If we can make a really good tasting meal, that's going to keep things really running in, in a smooth situation. If you get invited to somebody's house and they serve you oatmeal with nothing in that oatmeal, are you excited to come back? <laughs> Probably not. Now if you are, I'm, great, you really must love oatmeal. But the reality is, is when someone invites you over to have a great meal, whatever it might be, let's just think of a Thanksgiving feast. How many different varieties of food do you have? You've got your turkey, your ham, the stuffing, the sweet potatoes, like all these different things. There's variety, right? It's not one uniform food. Think of cover crops the exact same way. The more variety, the more multi-species mix you have in there, the more benefit you add to the other species, to the other situation. So Justin talked a little bit about, you know, bugs and how they love diversity. There's different plants that host different beneficial insects. The more you add in there, the more variety you will have, the better off you will be for balancing your system. That's why we add so many of these different ones. And a lot of times when we're planting permanent crops, we'll probably plant anywhere from 12 to 18 different species in those four major groups. Um, and depending on what our history is, I'll balance you know, about 25% of my um, seeds in that grass area, 40%, sometimes in legumes, and then the other ones between broadleaves and grasses. So I'm always changing ratios of what those are. This is the cool season grasses that we play with. Uh, some of them, there's a lot that, that are out there. This is just a few of them that, that work well that we like to play with. Um, but we also look at uh, ones even out of this list. This list isn't all inclusive, right? We also got the brassicas. Uh, brassicas are always fantastic. Those are the pretty mustard, right? When you drive by a field and it's got all these pretty yellow flowers and it gets really tall, those are brassicas. And those are fantastic at breaking up compaction. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges that you guys get to see on your fields um, is we create some amazing compaction layers when we're driving back and forth in an orchard system. Um, we plant these, they break this up like crazy. They'll drill right through it. But the key thing is making sure that it's planted correctly. Um, this is the last one, the broad leaves. Um, so there's a few of those, but I won't go into detail on every single one. We can talk for hours on all these different ones and show you the good ones, the bad ones, all of the details. But more importantly, I just want you guys to see that there are a lot of different things out there. There's a lot of different varieties that we need to be playing with, not just one or two species of cover crop things. So this is what uh, some of these blends look like. It's actually kind of cool. There's on the table back there, yeah, those are just two different blends that we played with last year. Every year, we kind of tweak a little bit and uh, maybe add a quarter pound of one thing or pull out certain things that might be hard to kill that maybe make it a challenge, but we're always tweaking that and we have a lot of different mixes that we play with and we also customize mixes directly to what your field needs. So if your field has a lot of compaction issues, water infiltration problems, nematode problems, we're designing and picking species that are very specific to addressing those problems. Not just like, yep, everybody gets the same thing. So one of the fun things that we get to do during this time of the year is we have uh, quite a few different types of seeders. Um, this one right here is one of our heavy duty no-till seeders. So we actually took a John Deere no-till row unit. It's a single disc opener. And we mounted it on this bar and we have an air seeder so we can drive up and down mature almond trees, pistachios, walnuts. It's about 13 feet wide and we can plant about 13 to 12 feet wide. We can even go narrower if we want, we just drop off row units. But the key thing is we do no tillage ahead of time. This is going into an extremely hard, like concrete, our normal orchard floors and almonds. 
That's what we're going into. And we're getting anywhere from three quarters of an inch to an inch deep in hard soil. Now imagine when you get a rain. Now we can actually go into that pretty easily. So now we have to back off the pressure. But with this system, we have three of these. And we run these up and down the valley. We've gone way up to Modesto, way down to Bakersfield. If you have almonds, if you have pistachios, if you have any permanent crop that we can fit this in, we will bring it to you and we rent these out to you guys to make sure that you have the right tool for the job. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people have different uh, types of failures because of how they established the cover crop. If you just plant it with a normal grain drill, uh, nothing against the John Deere 750 in-wheel drills, those are great in the right situation, right? If the soil is already soft, if it's sandy, they do fine. They do a great job of getting it in. But if you're dealing with extremely hard, compacted soil, this is the tool to use. And we've we spent a lot of time designing this and finding the right row units to make this work. I want to make sure that you guys minimize tillage, right? I do not want you to have to go disc ahead of planting a cover crop, right? I want to be able to go in there no-till as much as possible. That is critical. That's minimizing tillage changes everything. That when you leave microbes alone, you start to get fungal communities that develop that are far more efficient than a bacterially dominant soil. So minimize tillage, do not disc, do not do anything like that. No-till, no-till, no-till. And that's why we have these drills. Extremely heavy duty. Now, we can run these things at seven to eight miles an hour. And we can get a lot done really fast. I think, Memo, you might have the record. You have, what, 95 or 100 acres in one day done? Amazing. Who's flying with that? And it, it's impressive. And it all came up, right? Yeah. Yeah. You might not even need to prune your orchard after going through really fast. Um, but no, it does a really good job. But we also have, um, we call them limb lifters. So it actually goes through, if you look back on there, it's designed to gently lift. You see we have like UHMW to be able to prevent anything from really getting destroyed. Um, our goal is not to mess up any of the trees. We want to push everything out of the way. And most of the time, we have very little issue. We follow the same silhouette of what the tractor goes through, through the orchard. So minimal disturbance on that. Uh, principle number two for soil health, minimize disturbance, right? Um, that's really critical. And we That seed box holds probably 60, 70 acres worth of seed. So we can go a long way really fast. Um, this is the one that's actually parked back there, if you guys want to look at that. This is kind of our mid-duty to light-duty drill that we work with. Um, this, we've put some no-till coulters in front of it to help break up some of those um, action layers because this is kind of like a brilliant. I don't know if you guys know what a brilliant seeder is. This just sprinkles seed lightly on the soil. We have to have this to incorporate and bring up some of the dirt. And then we've got some uh, rollers on the back to kind of press the seed in the soil. So this does a really good job in lighter soil um, that can easily be uh, moved around. And then also we have a five foot vineyard drill that we work with um, in grape situations. Or we can actually run this up and down in really wide spacing right up next to the tree row. So I know Andrew might be talking about that a little bit about what you have done and I've got some pictures of what we do in certain situations where we're getting the seed right next to where the double line drip is and sometimes leaving the centers wide open. Um, that's a whole other fun conversation. There's a million ways to do this but we have tools and so if you guys don't have the right tools or if you do have a tool that you're kind of curious about we can help you with that. We, our biggest goal is to make sure that you have the ability to get cover crop in the ground the right way, right? We are trying to prevent failures. That's why we have equipment that we rent out to. Um, this is actually that situation where we ran right up next to the drip line. And this is an interesting situation because this grower um, has almonds on the west side. He's right across the street from the uh, Five Points Research uh, Station. And this grower has tried every single water penetrant that you can imagine to improve getting water into the soil. I don't know how many products he's actually tried, but he has a lot of experience with that. And every single one of those products that he's played with, he's been disappointed. It's like, well, they gave me that. They said the water's gonna improve, infiltrate faster. It's gonna do this, it's gonna do that. Every single one of those products has failed in one way or another, except using pepper crop, 
planted right next there, he no longer has ponding. Throughout the entire summer, he has no ponding issues. Before, it looked like he would flood irrigate this field. And to make matters worse, he's in the west. So he does not have a whole lot of extra water to deal with. So any water that he can get in, that's a huge win. Well, this is, I think, the third season that he'd done that. Every year, got better and better and better. Planting cover crops right next to that zone makes these trees also look way better in the month of June. So I think I have a picture of that a little bit later, showing what that looks like for the whole termination period, because I know some of you are probably wondering, how does he manage that for harvest? I'll get to that. That's one of the next topics. But this is just termination and evaluation, right? When we all look at how are we going to terminate this cover crop, and if we're up against the wall with water, we're going to look at terminating it different ways than if we don't have to worry about that, or if we're right next to the middles. There's a lot of things that I want you guys to understand that we can help you with for the desired outcome. Not everybody's the same here. You guys have very different operations. You have different irrigation systems. You have different water challenges. The key thing that I want you guys to see is there is variation, but we're here, and that's why we have so many different tools to help you with. So we want to walk with you every step of the way with that. So situations like this, um, rolling it down with a ring roller, knocking down a lot of the brassicas, and then eventually a lot of those other small grasses, uh, the legumes, they'll pop through, no problem. Then we mow that. And then we have this beautiful thatch that's underneath. And I think Andrew has some cool pictures of how much the soil has changed by leaving all of that thatch on there in his pistachios. It is dark brown, and then below that in the soil is a very light-colored soil. He's making soil one cover crop at a time, and he's preserving it by not disking all the time. There's some amazing things that he'll talk about later today. Um, situations like this, yeah, seven-foot tall cover crop, that's a challenge. That is, but there were some situations, I don't know, I have another picture, uh, not in this presentation, but that is up in La Grande, and there's just as much rocks in that soil as there is dirt. Very challenging, and for the trees to be able to hold the water and look that good, we're trying to add as much biomass and create as much organic matter as possible. So remember, we're fighting rocks in that situation. Um, that's why it's kind of up a little bit higher with the mower. He doesn't want to have to mow rocks because he doesn't want to make gravel. Um, now some things to observe, and I always run into this situation with cover crops, is during the winter time when we plant, our ideal time when we're trying to look at the planting window is November, December realistically. That's, we're wanting to get a little bit of soil moisture, say we get a rain or two in November, fantastic. But realistically, planting in that month of November and December for almonds, and then we look at pistachios, we're going all the way into February planting cover crops. And we've gone into early March, but March is... Hey, Bonnie Bottoms. I know a lot of the faces in here, but there's lots of new faces. So really, really uh, appreciate you coming today and learning what we're all about. Uh, cover crops is definitely a part of what we do as part of an agronomic system, but it's just one thing. So, as a farmer myself, I realize there's multiple hats we have to wear. We have to, you know, market a crop, we have to grow the crop, and we have to do it uh, as efficiently as we possibly can. So, um, I first came to California in 2001 to run a Case I dealership out in Firebaugh. Fell in love with the valley, and in 2004 we started California Exhibitions with the intention of reducing tillage. And uh, that led into the use of cover crops originally. Uh, in processing tomatoes, and now today cover crops are four. And we also started with biologicals in, back in 2004. Now today biologicals are cool. So what we're excited about is some of the things, advanced work that we're doing right now that will be cool in 20 years. So uh, really appreciate you taking a moment out of your time and your extraordinarily busy schedules to, to learn what we've got going on. Um, I did want to backfill a few things. First off, because of the work of Matt, Roy, and Silas and what they're doing, trying to help these uh, boards understand cover crops change the imagery that we're getting back off of these fields. And uh, I can say this now because I moved back to our farm in Illinois. I think using imagery to determine water utilization 
has to be the, right up there with one of the dumbest things I can imagine. Because uh, ag tech, I'm an ag tech investor and, and a part of a lot of ag tech startup uh, groups throughout the Midwest and, and out of Sacramento. When we create a healthier plant that has a better NDVI image because we're managing the crop correctly, because we're doing tillage correctly, and everything's growing correctly, you have to use the same amount of water, guess what happens to the NDVI signature? It improves. Which then, compared to a conventionally produced crop, makes it appear that it utilizes more water. So, when we're growing these cover crops and we're actually infiltrating more water because the cover crop is there, even though the green is on the ground, currently, that shows as a negative. But because the work that they're doing and many others trying to get this where it doesn't negatively impact you because it's definitely a positive for your operation. So I'm, I'm excited to thank you guys for what you're doing to make the awareness out there that uh, cover crops are a net positive, not a net negative for the water balancing. So I do want to talk about that today, uh, the art of balancing. and. Uh, also, some of the unexpected benefits of cover crops. I remember when I started working with cover crops on our own farm about 10 years ago, um, I started discovering that the main reasons I did them was not the main benefits of what we received out of them. So it's kind of a head turner. You'll notice this too as you start to integrate cover crops on your own farm or within your own practices. What you expect to happen will be completely different than the benefits that you actually receive. So I'm going to throw out some unexpected benefits for you to be watching for. Because the best thing, I've said it before, and, and, and this is a quiz to see if anybody's ever remembered anything I've ever said, there's two best things you can put in your field at any time of the year. What is that? What's that? Footprint. Yep. I say shadow. Okay. What's the other best thing that you can do to put in your field? Shovel. Shovel. That's right. See what's going on underground. So put your shadow and the shovel in the field. It's the two best things you can ever put in there to see what's going on. And then we'll go through some steps to get started. But first, we have to address compaction. So compaction is a bad thing in the field, correct? You know where the worst form of compaction can exist? My dad says it's a six inch distance between our ears, okay? Sometimes that's the most compacted real estate on planet Earth because, let's face it, we can all be a little hard-headed at times, especially if you're married, right? You've become professional at that. And uh, this is one of my favorite quotes, and uh, one of our head formulators that formulated most of our biological products always used to tell me this. He says, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. I love the means of that, right? Ain't ain't a word, I ain't going to use it. But it's true. It's the things that get us that we thought was the way and the only way it could be. So always be willing to be wrong. Always be willing to challenge yourself. Be willing to try new things. And another one of my favorite series is uh, good judgment comes from experience. And experience comes from what? Bad judgment, right? So make some bad judgments, learn to make better judgments, right? Let me ask you this, what are growers in the room, what do you worry about with water? What's on your mind? Is it Sigma? Is it the state water project decisions? <laughs> or federal? Is it the snowpack we're going to get? Is it the rainfall that we're going to get? Is it climate change and how that's changing our rainfall, snowfall patterns? But why do you worry about what you get versus how you use it? So my question is, can you change any of these things? But that's in the news all the time, right? It's in our daily emails, it's in the magazines, the newspapers, always talking about the production of water. Who in here controls the production of the water? Well, God, because he's everywhere. But other than that, nobody else, right? So we have to focus on what we're given. Okay? If you go to the if you go to the coffee shop or a community event and you hear people complaining about that, just walk away. Don't let them take you there. Okay? Because you've got to be thinking about what you're given and what you can do with it, how can you maximize it. 
So really we have to look at it, what we're doing today, to invest water today to make more water tomorrow. And that's a key part of our cover crop scope. So it's this balancing dynamic that we have to really think about what we invest today for so that we can have more tomorrow. Are we willing to uh, look at optimizing our yield to, to water versus maximizing our yield to acre? Those are two different answers. How do we choose to spend water? Okay? You're spending water as evaporation, whether you like it or not. You're spending it that way because the way that you put it out in the field and the timing of how you put it out in the field and the quantity and the distribution affects the evaporation. It also affects runoff. If you get winter rains, if we keep, you know, half inch rain this time of year, that's, that's pretty wild, right? About 10 inches in some places. But if we get winter rains, how are you spending that? Are you keeping it in your field? Or better yet, I love we have a field where it just completely ran off the neighbor's field, went over the road, and went into one of our customers' fields and had cover crops. So not only did he soak in all of his own rain, he soaked in all of his neighbor's rain. So, and he didn't even have to send a check to the neighbor. So how are you doing managing your runoff? You know, cash crop use. How are we using it for the cash crop? How are we allocating that water to a cover crop? How are we investing it? Leaching, how are you using water for leaching? Okay, are you leaching intentionally or accidentally? You know, distribution uniformity. This is a decision that you're making too. If you make the decision to not inspect your system every year and make updates and improvements to your system every year on pressure and, and replacement parts, you are choosing to have bad distribution uniformity. You're choosing to waste water, okay? It's a sin of omission. Okay? You may not be doing it, but you, but you are doing it by not properly maintaining distribution uniformity. So those are all things uh, how we're choosing to spend water. And let's look at some of the past choices we've made and how we spend water and how it affects us today. We've chosen high ET crops. When I came to California, there was a lot of cotton here. We don't use quite as much water as all of us About twice or about half as much. We've chosen IBT crops. We're living beyond our means, folks. We've chosen high planting density. We had a wild talk about this on the break, but every tree uses so much water, every spur uses so much water prior to producing nut. If you don't give that spur, for example, the optimal amount of light time, you won't preserve, you won't, excuse me, create the optimal amount of nuts per spur. When we go to high density plantings, our nut per spur is lower than at lower density plants. It's great when we've got four or five feet just to burn out on almond trees, plant trees thick. But if you want two two fruits per spur with two feet of water, that ain't gonna work. We have to look at bigger spaces, better light utilization, more three-dimensional approach to farming instead of two-dimensional. Irrigation systems. You know, micro sprinklers versus double line drip versus buried double line drip and the efficiencies. We're dealing with those things today because they're legacy. So what do you choose today? Your irrigation scheduling. We've got data that can tell you and we've we've known this. How many years ago did you do that? Did we do that study, Antonio? How many years have been? Six years. That we learned that you feed if you feed trees in two to three hour increments, it's most water use efficient. So we've known that now for six or seven years. I would assume that everybody in the room has got a system that allows us to put out water in two to three hour increments and switch automatically, right? You're special now. And that's why you sit up front, because you're very special. No. But I'm saying we know these things, but water isn't getting any cheaper. You know, and if you're waiting for electronics to get cheaper, lucky to get it, right? But those are these kind of things that we need to be changing today. You know, maintenance and upgrades, those kind of things. Plus, we have to choose to invest a little bit of money in those cover crops. So the five soil health principles, keep the soil covered, minimize soil disturbance, maximize diversity, living roots at all times, and you can do that in California, it's great. I got five months, four months out of the year, I can't have a living root because it's old. And then integrate livestock, Believe it or not, you know, we actually have Silas, what's the number now? We have four or five producers in 
integrated livestock into trees. How wild is that? So better get the livestock so you're not behind like you are on the, on the uh, irrigation automation, okay? Um, then uh, the expected benefits of cover crops. I wanted to talk about that a little bit. What do you, why do you do cover crops? We're expecting free nutrients, right? Let's go wall to wall hairy vetch and just get all kinds of nitrogen for free, right? We want to increase soil carbon because we've heard that's good. That's some of the things we want to do. We want to reduce compaction. We want to use roots to till, right? Is that the kind of the expected reasons we do cover crops? And by the way, Silas brought this up, 24 to 1. Who remembers what that was? 24 parts of what? Carbon. Carbon, one part? Nitrogen. Okay, what happens if you put in a solid dairy bench crop and, and the, it's a 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio? What happens then to your soil? Have any idea? It wants to be 24 to 1, so where does the carbon come from? Your soil. So if you want to burn carbon out of your soil, over apply nitrogen, whether it's from a fertilizer dealer or from a cover crop. You will burn carbon out of your soil. So you have to pay attention to these ratios, and you have to pay attention to the termination and the management of those cover crops where we add carbon, not burn it away. So here's some of the things I want you to think about as far as some of the unexpected benefits of cover crops that I've seen over the years. We've talked about it today. This wasn't an expected benefit, but now I think we all know water infiltration, right? So we sell Edmax. It's an awesome water penetrant. But we'd rather see you use a cover crop and have it work well for you for helping with those infiltration rates. Weed suppression. How many weeds are going to make it through there? Plant the weeds you want, or nature will send the weeds you don't want. Okay? I'd rather have that than alba and jungle grass, or what, what is that crazy stuff that they got down hand for? Barn yard grass. Yeah, yeah. You don't want those things. Next thing, temperature moderation. This is a big deal within Canada, no matter what it is. We, we saw this early on in tomatoes back in the late 2000s or late 2008 or 9, is we have a lot better late season uh, ability to not crash because the surface temperature is lower. Erosion control might be an issue. You don't think of erosion here as water, but it's definitely as wind, especially when we head up the sands up there in Del Nye, it's a big deal. Dust control, that's a big deal too. So we're not creating dust to put up on the plants to create the habitat for the mic to come in and, and cause a problem. Okay, so anytime we eliminate that dust emission, we're doing better for photosynthetic activity on the plant, also for pest uh, resistance. Mite suppression is, yeah, combined with that. Beneficial habitat, you know, Justin referred to that. Pollinator habitat, you know, what do those, what do the bees go to after, um, after we have the bloom? How do we keep them happy and healthy for, for the future? Bird habitat, I see this all the time with our grazing that we do on cover crops. Uh, I have a flock of probably 500 birds of you know, 10 different species that actually follow the cattle through the field. It's you know, wasteland anywhere else around like the corn soybean rotation. So it's, uh, it's amazing the difference in bird habitat. But, hey, we're not about growing birds, okay? And we're not about growing earthworms, okay? But you look for earthworms in the soil, why? It's an indicator species of soil health. They're kind of the top of the food pyramid within the soil. And guess what? You can see them without a microscope. So we're not looking for earthworms, but we know if there's lots of earthworms there, a lot of great things are going on in the soil. I feel like there's a lot of great things going on in the plant health and community. Look for birds and diversity of birds. Uh, grazing opportunities, my favorite thing. This is a, a cow out here. This is a uh, summer pasture that was overseeded with winter annuals. And to watch this, uh, uh, I think these are, I can't remember what they were, they're heifers or what they were, but the British whites. She was going from row to row to row to row and avoiding the grass. Um, you know what? Plus it's beautiful. I'd rather look at something green than something brown. And honestly, because of all the different options we have, it makes farming fun again. It really does. And it makes research fun again. Now, this is Jeff Mitchell. He's been, you know, 
two of us are kind of uh, brothers from other brothers, I guess. Uh, but we're, uh, uh, he, he's been really beating the drum for cover crops for, for many years in the valley and has the longest uh, continuous cover crop study down there at the Five Points Research Station. And we were having fun one day, went out, and I dug some plants, and I said, oh yeah, look at this rhizosheath. And he'd never been out there to dig triticale before and see the rhizosheath. So it's just like he had a little child there, you can see on his face. This is part of making farming fun again, seeing what's going on. So it's important to start with a plan. You know, set up a plan with your CAS advisor. What do you want to accomplish? Everybody's goals are a little bit different. You all have different uh, crops, different legacies that you want to leave, and, and those kind of things. What is it you want to accomplish? And you have to assess your context, okay? Every field, every farm is different. Planting plan, you have to have that plan. The time are going to plant, going to arrange, are we going to irrigate up? What's the mix selection? What kind of machinery? How are we going to do it? Those kind of things. Are we going to run a whole rickety drill that you have to disc in order to run it? Well, that's kind of like shooting your foot to you know, make your other one better and not feel as bad, right? So, I mean, you just got to think through those things. Water plant, uh, are, how much are we going to do? Are we going to use any spring water for the, for the cover crop? Termination plant, this is critical. Are we going to use chemistry or roll it or fill it? How, are we going to use heat? You know, some plants will just die from the heat if they're winter annuals. Residue management. Are we going to mow it? Are we going to graze it? Are we going to bale it and sell it for more than what the almonds are worth? Are we going to harvest? You know, what are we? What are we going to do? Right? Don't laugh, but it's not kind of true. <laughs> nutrition plan. Uh, you know, we have to shift nutrition because the decomposition of microtene first happens. We have to move that nutrition up to overcome what the microbes are tying up from the decomposition of the cover crops. So that's critical. And then sometimes harvest plan and equipment changes. We have to be ready to address those kind of issues, especially if we're harvesting whole plants like tomatoes or we've got almonds on the ground. How are we going to make sure we've got the residue to deal with the problem? Is that you telling me I'm out of time or is it clicker? Let's hit a clicker. Let's see what we got. We might be having a difficult. Now, now it's working again. Uh, so like I said, we started in 2005. We're your resource. We've adapted equipment. The land all uh, John Deere, Great Plains, California cover crops. I love the John Deere. I'm a former case, I'm a recovery case I guy. I love the John Deere drill. So that tells you how good it is. And it, it really works great with that Salford air tank on there to get through the trees. They're all available for rent so you're ready to invest. But when you're ready to invest, we'll help you find one, create your own, or we roll out our cover crop uh, seeders on a regular basis. We've got lots of years of experience with multi-species. You know, if you're doing just one species, uh, you, you don't like to eat the same thing every day for dinner. I mean, a steak's great, but after, you know, 10 months in a row, a steak gets kind of boring. Uh, integrate crop nutrition biology products that address the system changes. you got to ask yourself, cover crops from a business Perspective, our low margin crop, our low margin product for us to sell. So why are we interested in that? Because we like owning equipment that costs a lot of money that just basically breaks even. This is not a wise business decision on its own for us. But we're system thinkers. Guess what cover crops allow our biologically based plant nutrition system to do? Perform even better. That's why we do it. And it'll make a bigger difference for you, especially if you put our power to grow program on top. And the fifth element, fifth soil health principle, we have the grazing experience. This is something to definitely explore. So basically, like farmers insurance, you know a thing or two because you've seen it, right? You've probably seen this commercial. So invest. If you chose to be here today, invest in yourself. Tomorrow you can choose to invest in your soils. And the bottom line is soil is life. So you need to invest wisely in our soils because that's all that we have to support our lives. Remember, quit farming naked. Nobody likes to see your dirt. <laughs> Keep learning to tune in. I have a lot of fun doing this Aggie Bird podcast thing. Um,
started out as something simple, and we've got like all the heavy hitters of soil health have, have been on there or are going to be on there in the future. It's a lot of fun to do. I just get to sit there and ask questions of these rock stars. And uh, if you haven't tuned in, please do. If you got a suggestion for someone you'd like to hear on there, let me know. We have a lot of fun doing that. So uh, it's something fun. Yeah, but it can happen. You know, here's using, here's taking cover crops to the next level with mulch on the beds. There's lots, of, lots of fun things. So anyway, I uh, I appreciate it, and uh, we're gonna take a little break. Ask questions. Um, ask them anything about cover crops, obviously. Um, but to find out, you know, what got them interested? Why do they keep doing it? Uh, it's really interesting to get everybody's perspective. And these guys, um, pistachios and almonds, Mark is almonds, Shannon is both pistachio and almonds. So there's a lot of neat experiences that they've all had. And it's better if they say a lot of what their experiences are than me. I'll probably mess it up. So. You guys want to take it away? Um, I think we can start with questions that you guys might have. I think that's probably the best way to start. Um, so if you have questions, just raise your hand. I'll get you a mic so everybody can hear. And then you guys can just take turns answering it, from different perspectives, your experience, your beginning, the challenges, the fun, all those different things. Any questions? Yes. So uh, So what's cool about the two of you, and I, your brother's uh, son, son of yeah. is that uh, obviously you guys are in there, okay? And uh, the first cover crop I saw was uh, at Shannon's, and I was, you know, I should have said that in uh, my portion of it, but uh, it was a little mind-boggling to see something like that. Uh, that's probably been five years ago. Uh, the one person that, that was my, uh, you know, the person that I, I looked to is, I said, on a stretch. Uh, you and Norma always meet on the corner in the evening, and, uh, and Norma's just a total thanks there. So when you talk to Norma, how did you uh, how did how did you present that? To him? Because it was that year that she changed, and she doesn't change ever. Yeah. Um, doing that good. Well, a little back history on Mrs. Stretch is I used to mow her lawn when I was nine years old. <laughs> So that being said, it's always been Mrs. Stretch. It's always been my peer, my elder, and somebody, somebody that, and her husband as well, spent a lot of time working for him, part-time at my dad and my, our own family farm. So there's always a high sense of respect and honor towards them. So it was never do what I do. It was, it was always I learned from them, and they always had an open door to questions, and that's how I learned a lot throughout life. So that being said, is I just got into this cover crop thing through Silas Monty California Ag Solutions because it made sense to me and just started doing it. And through time, she started asking questions and we'd share notes back and forth. So I think the best way to say it is seeing is believing and then watching over periods of time. I feel my best learning of experiences in farming were always looking to my peers and my neighbors that were progressive and successful in ability and financially and I spent a lot of time on a motorcycle and in a pickup just constantly driving around and looking at what other people were doing and I think in that sense that's how she kind of came on board and then with Silas and you know there's the, the thought and the sight and then there's the what do you call it the academics behind it and that's where Silas follows through. I kind of follow more emotionally, so it seems to work out. That's how it worked out. So, yeah. <laughs> well, we used to, uh, you know, a lot of cotton was king, right, in the 70s here. So we used to figure out how to try to turkey manure or whatever, try to uh, grow barley or whatever afterwards to go back to back if you didn't have corn out of and such. So uh, my dad was doing like strawberry clover many years ago, but again, that's, that's one variety. And we were stressing here, what we stressed today was having many varieties. And it was, it was beautiful when it came up, but when it was done, it was done. And it, it wouldn't, we couldn't keep it long enough, I guess, for it to reseed itself. 
Uh, but a couple items that wasn't even mentioned today as far as there's concern of cover crops is a uh, frost issue, freezing, right? Which is, which was a, a happened this year, right? Up, especially in Northern California. And, uh, uh, and another was just pollinization. You think, okay, you've got flowers, cover crops, are, are, are they gonna get up in the trees and pollinate my trees? Just one, one example, at the end of the season this year, uh, my cover crops are just doing great. My beekeeper uh, hives come from Washington, state of Washington. They were delayed in getting them out. Normally when it's done, then I can get them out and move them to other crops in Washington. Well, they're delayed about two weeks for trucking issues, whatever. Well, when he, when he got my hives back, he could not believe how heavy they were and how healthy they were. And I was expecting, I didn't have a bill yet uh, for my bees, and, and I think the prices have gone up on everybody last year again. I don't know how much, but he said, just keep, keep your price the same, please, and tell your neighbors to be doing what you're doing. Because normally they got to almost start from scratch when they take these hives out to rebuild them again. And ours were just so totally healthy. And my neighbors were kind of dragging their feet getting theirs out because they were benefiting from the bees from our cover crop. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, different side again is, is the freeze uh, freeze potential. Uh, since we have simios in our in our in our fields, we didn't notice any difference. Uh, and uh, you can you know you have these monitors specified to so many acres, you can see how low it gets, right? And where we've done conventional uh, thermometers. Uh, across the way where it was bare, there was no difference. There was even a, a time I was seeing, usually your inverted layer, it's normally always warm at, at the top, right, of the tree, and, and your cold air uh, settles to the bottom. Well, it was reversed. It was actually warmer below than it was at the top, and, and it's all recorded. Uh, so I just thought that was pretty phenomenal, because that's, that's a, it's a big, it's a big concern, right? Uh, freeze. So uh, I think that's not an issue with these. And, and maybe it depends on the type of cover crops that are actually helping generate just the metabolism of the, the energy that's going on, you know? So uh, that hasn't, I think, hasn't been an issue for me. What got you started, Andrew? <laughs> you got one up. Um, so I started farming 10 years ago. I started working for my father-in-law. I married into it. I didn't know anything about farming at all. Um, but when it came to spraying, he, he would put me out on the spray rig and I go, why are we doing this? You know, and the answer was always, well, this is how we've always done it. This is how we've always done it. And for me, that answer just doesn't work because it's, it's not even an answer, right? Like, it's not addressing anything. And so I, I was asking questions from day one. Well, we started working with CAS uh, probably two years into my experience. And then they started talking about cover cropping, right? And my father-in-law's like, well, you know, that's a little weird. And I'm like, well, it sounds interesting, you know, like maybe let's try it out. I think the next year we ended up trying it out. So now we're seven years into cover cropping. Um, and the results have been absolutely insane. Uh, you're talking about like cost savings, right? That's a big thing for farmers is, is where we save money. Um, on average, we're saving about $600 an acre per year versus what we're spending in conventional farming. Um, our yields, you might get a year where we drop 100 pounds an acre, but when you're saving $600 an acre, what, what does it matter? You know, it, it doesn't. Um, so, you know, we've seen just a, such a shift on our farm, you know, and I've taken that to the other properties that I work to, and, and we've seen those same kinds of shifts, if not more, because of, you know, pushing the buck a little bit further. Um, so it, it's been very interesting. It's been an interesting ride, for sure. That, that's how I got started. Each one of you guys is really enthusiastic. Is it what Lonnie said? Yeah, making farming fun again. Yeah. We need to make the MAFA hat. 
Sorry, that's not fun. So Andrew, with like what you're doing, what you're seeing, because you do both um, mature pistachios as well as mature almonds. Um, I know you guys started more on the almonds, but what were some of the things that you learned to transition? What were some of the challenges? What were some of the things that you kind of learned in pistachios that you put, brought back into almonds? You've had an interesting journey with soil health and limited water yes. on that far side. Yeah, so I have a pistachio property that is uh, on Avenue 21 between Road 27 and Road 28, uh, out towards the foothills. Um, on average, the last two years, we've been averaging about a half inch of water a week. Um, it's been pretty rough, right? Uh, more so for my neighbors than for me. Um, one thing that I've noticed is that I'm able to extend uh, the water in my um, soil a lot longer than my neighbors, right? So if I get a 24-hour watering period to water two sets, so that's 12 hours of water on each set, I'll go out there with my moisture probe, say three or four days after in July, and I'll check everybody around me, and then I'll go and check my field. Dry, 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 and I still have moisture, right? You're 100 plus, I still have moisture in the ground. I have these guys coming over and telling me, well, you know, all that cover crop is going to take the moisture away from your trees. How can it be when I still have moisture in the ground and you have none? All of yours went away to evaporation, right? Mine's being held there. Um, so it's been interesting to watch that. Um, one thing that I've really liked about the pistachios versus the almonds is the build of organic matter, which Silas kind of talked about before. It's hard to do that with the almonds the way that we're harvesting right now. I hate the way that we harvest almonds. I despise it. I want to do away with it. Um, my biggest thing is we pull all that organic matter out of the field every year. You know, and we don't allow that buildup. Um, I, I have pictures on my phone from my pistachio property where I have organic matter this thick in just three years' time. You know, and that's helped me to really cut back on my uh, synthetic fertilizers. You know, so I, I think, I don't know the exact number, but I'm guessing 40 gallons to the acre for nitrogen, maybe 30? Yeah, 40 at the most. Yeah, it's very light, you know, whereas my neighbors are doing 100 plus, um, if not more. Yeah, uh, Madera Irrigation District. So there's 3,000 acres of pistachios out there. Yeah, and they're all doing it the same way, and they're all in trouble. Yes, great guy. Yeah. But we need to get to that with the almonds, right? Where we can build up that organic matter. I think that's the point there. Well, you've got some great pictures that show that. So that's yes. something that we can show you guys if you're interested later. Um, Mark, what have been some of your probably biggest challenges that you had with cover crops in the beginning, but yet overcame them? I don't know. Uh, I mean, like, since we kind of had a history of cover crops, but or like cotton and such over the years, yeah, uh, you're always worried about the abundance of trash at harvest time. So. Uh, the Norma stretch uh, process when she would uh, using a well, there's 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 been different type of flails that would pulverize it, and and, and Shannon's had this uh, with Richie yeast where you would flip that pulverization of your your cover crop on bare dirt, and it would break down. Norma on one one year, she just went in with her. It just got way out of hand. This unit was just too light duty and was breaking down. So she just went over with her flail and then she just came in there with her almond sweeper, changed the, the direction of the, uh, uh, and actually flipped her debris on the berm. And I, I did that this year. Uh, this year, uh, her manager was saying, well, you know what, I don't know. Well, I remember she, they, they flipped it three times on their berm and I don't know how the end of the story happened because I think they were going to shake their nuts right on top of that. But, but we were able to, it was quick for us, uh, Memo, we're, we're going eight miles an hour. I mean, you, you got to be right on track when you're, you're sweeping, right? But it didn't take that long to flip it on. And then just before harvest, I don't know, maybe three weeks before harvest, we actually pulled it back off again and then to the center and just made one uh, a shredder right down the middle. And it just, it just pulverized it. So anything, anything we could do to cover the dirt, uh, evaporation is real, right? And uh, so 
Um, we've always been very hesitant about a little scared about getting too much and, and getting behind the eight ball and just having a complete mess. So we've just slowly been doing things uh, and getting a little more courageous each year uh, on doing that. So oh, I probably could have flipped it one more time, you know, after we have flailed. But that was our concept. Okay, we're going to pull it back off, and it's, it's all dry, and we just flail it, and boom, there's not, nothing much left. And I'm going the same speed as I would, you know, I'm still going like 3.7 miles an hour without a, without a conditioner. And, and you don't get a dust bowl from just dirt when you're seeing your neighbors that are a uh, half a mile away, you're seeing the, the dust going up a mile, really. There's something different about the, the dust from the, the trash, that small piece of it doesn't it doesn't lift up and it just stays in your orchard, I think, pretty much. So, and that's where I want to keep it. Yeah, you got to make sure you blow afternoons, yeah. Where it's, 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 it's brittle. Yeah, you don't want your, you don't want to do on anything you're going to flail to break down, you know, to afternoons. might have been the most important thing today, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> uh, when we first started, uh, when our cover crops, that one picture you saw, uh, it was like seven, eight feet. Uh, the first year we were using, I, I still have an old four row uh, cotton shredder, John Deere cotton shredder. It's a rotary. So that was fun just to go in there. We're just, we're taking it down to a couple feet that first time to get to start terminating those brassicas, the mustards, and to get sunlight down into those clovers. And that's, and that's when you really start seeing the clovers get some sunlight and, and start to grow. And that's what you'll see pretty much continue uh, throughout the rest of the year. Um, so that was a lot of fun. But you can still use a flail and just, just lift it up, you know, and, and you don't wanna, you wanna do it in stages if you can. Ready for a question? Let me expound upon that. I, I, Ben has done a great job of you know, helping me see the beauty in a lot of this, and I think what's been fun is as we've planted cover crops throughout the years, we have um, actually engineered the ones on certain fields for purely aesthetics. We just want pretty flowers, we want it to look like this, and then kind of see okay, what are the benefits that we get out of that? Um, you want to expound a little bit about that, just you know what has created that uh, desire. Oh, the aesthetics. Yeah, the aesthetics. Oh, that came from my dad. That uh, my dad is a row crop farmer. Then he was in the almonds, and now he took his almonds out. So now he's a happy farmer. So <laughs> <laughs> he's not enduring the prices we're enduring right now, or near the water problems. But my dad was always a row crop farmer, and one year he he just does not like almond trees. He didn't want them around his house. He liked to see. He used to grow a lot of dry beans and that didn't really materialize anymore. So we got to a point, we planted uh, three acres of uh, knee-high sweet peas. And the reasoning behind that is me and my dad read the short story, The Harness by John Steinbeck. So it kind of created more of the idea of, you know, there's, you got to read the short story and you understand it. We did not participate in all parts of that story. But the idea was, is he got tired of having to grow a commodity to make a profit. And he felt that, you know, he lost his, you lose your soul over that, and you kind of become, how do you say this? You kind of become the slave to the master. So with that being said, one year he called me the next day, and he says, Shannon, I got an idea. And he says, I think mom's going to be okay with it, but we need to talk about it. So he had his cotton planter for one last year because he wanted to sell that to get rid of that. And he said, I'm going to plant flowers. And I said, well, what do you want to plant? And he says, I want to plant poppies. So with that being said, he went to, got the seed from L.A. Hearn, went to Salinas, got them coated so they could fit the same plates as the cotton planter, and he planted 20, 20 acres of California poppies. And the first year was a huge success. 
and it was beautiful. And he, he, he liked to pull weeds in his poppy field. That's what he enjoyed doing. And uh, he always called when people stopped, he says, this is God's food for the soul. So, in turn, that being my father, being inspired by my father, because it is my father, that's how in the cover crops. Sometimes it really doesn't matter as much as for your heart. So, it's not an economic value, it's more of a personal value. And the next year, the poppies did the same thing, and they blew up, and then we had a disaster. And he ended up mowing them. They were in full bloom, and he mowed them after Channel 47 went to the field and gave our address and invited the whole valley <laughs> to come visit. <laughs> so as my parents were sitting in their backyard, they'd see cars driving through their backyard. So with that being said, we took that 20 acres and we brought it down to five acres, and now we plant around it, so it's more of a family, personal moment. So, and with that being in the trees, like, we talk about cover crops, and every year I tell Silas, I want the flowers at almond flat, when the, when the trees bloom, and I can't seem to, I'm about a week or two off. So, that being beneficial for the bees, but more beneficial for me. So, that's when I want to have, like, lunch in the field, flowers on the highest range that you've ever seen. So, that's my goal. Well, it is actually a lot of fun because it breaks the chaos of the, the rat race that we can become absorbed in. Well, and in turn now, it's you and I who can have the best flowers in the yard in the spring. Yeah, so that's another competition <laughs> that me and I have with our yard. So it's kind of fun. But I think the most important thing, you know, that we have learned from that is, you know, the beauty that we're shooting for, we're still getting a lot of these same benefits in the field. So, you know, don't just look at the cover crop as another cash crop which there's a tremendous amount of benefits that it gets, but actually use it as an opportunity to just have fun. Because so many things can be challenging and depressing in our industry. So look for the opportunity to actually see the shining star. And, and I guess fun. that's going back to what Matt asked earlier about Mrs. Stretch. It's an opportunity to witness. And it's an opportunity to open a door without being aggressive. It's just an opportunity to witness to people and share your thoughts and ideas and not have high pressure. Because seeing is believing, and it's just, it's a soft opening instead of a hard bang. I'm not in sales. I've always appreciated Silas' sales motives because it's not aggressive and it doesn't pound you down, it lifts you up. And I think doing this and plus adding the flowers, whether it's a farmer or not a farmer, people will find their purpose in it. So yeah. One thing that when I, I first saw that field, and I think that was uh, for me, you know, we, we planted, you know, for many years, right? Like I could say, rye, good corn, wheat, whatever. And it, it wasn't that it was boring, it, it wasn't biologically the right thing, right? And when I sat down and talked to you guys, you started getting, you know, you saw the worm population and all the things that were going on, right? You knew that there was so much diversity. I think that's the, the message that I took away from there was the technology is in the varietal. And then, you know, like you said, Mark, you took off that top layer, you know what I mean? Which would have been the, the mustards, maybe the, the rye, whatever is in there. So it just tells you that biodiversity of that plant. And I think that's the important thing is the takeaway here, is that that's what you're trying to do is build that. That was the game changer. I think that's it. the key is the diversity. You look at a room full of all of us, there's a lot of neat diversity here. We have different experiences, different backgrounds, and the seeds are the same way. They all bring something different to the table, and not only on the top side, but with root exudates and all the different carbon structures that they build, it is amazing when you have diversity. If it's only one, you're very limited. If it was a company full of just me, we'd be good at one thing, but we wouldn't have the diversity that we have. There's things that Antonio's way better at than I'll ever be. And I'm okay with that because we're a team. And I think that's every single person on our team has great skills, great benefits that they add to the table to fulfill others' weaknesses, right? It's the exact same thing with cover crops. You're planting all these different species to mitigate some of the downfalls the other ones might have. So as a team of species, they're fantastic. It's a very well thought out plan with all these different attributes that are brought to the table with one planting. So, what other questions do you guys have?
Yeah, Rob. So I'm wondering if uh, you cheated and the three of you, uh, you know, through uh, the period when you went from the cover crop to cover crop and following the nutritional status of your, your trees uh, through tissue testing, did you see any difference there in the cover crops? Are you talking in terms of uh, like what we're able to cut back on and cut back or micros or cats or anything? Okay, so as far as like fertilizer out on my father in law's place, when I started there, what were we at with you in 32? Close to 300? Yeah. Right? 250, 300, somewhere around there. I think this year we were at like 60. Yeah. Right? So we made a huge cut back over that time. A lot of that happened in the first couple of years. Uh, so we've been pretty consistent, you know, with our UN32 now about anywhere between 50 and 70 a year. Um, so we were able to cut back drastically. And that's all across the board, right? Not just UN32, that's just one example. I don't know if we really cut back. I think we, we, we're um, intensely compost. We use a lot of compost. Uh, cut back on, say, commercial SOP, haven't used that in a long time, uh, nitrogen 40 units, and as far as, I don't do tissue samples that much, I don't do soil samples that much, I just look and I watch and see and I've seen, I don't know, a lot of, and I think we're coming into this side in the almond industry is where they call them second generation almond orchards, and second generation almond orchards are very hard to develop, just because You've been in almonds 25 years and you're going back into it. So I developed an 18 acre orchard and I went extreme, extreme cover cropping. Summer, winter. So by the time those trees came into production, I had five cycles of cover crops on it. And I've definitely seen the difference. So it's that's kind of been what I've noticed. Well, yeah, along that side. I think what too. was fun is we had a, a summer cover crop in there for two years. And that was taller than the trees. I had to drag the mower, a flail mower, and I planted in the summer. And instead of planting solid because I didn't have irrigation, I planted with a vineyard planter, so I stripped it. And the cover crop was probably seven feet tall, which I let it get too big because it started interfering with the growth of the tree. It started getting narrow on me. So when I was mowing it, I was probably going a mile and a half because I had so much sunflowers and sorghum. And going back to the beginning, I had people stopping me and saying, taking pictures with the sunflowers because they're pretty. And they were beautiful. I mean, it was gorgeous. Beautiful color, green, and then those bright sunflowers. So, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I don't know. I did soil sampling and stuff like that. I just haven't done that. Another thing too is that nobody's mentioned. Well, I think Andrew has. Is that on my personal orchard, I haven't used Roundup in I think four or five years. I've used uh, just rely burn downs. I never. Um, I don't use pre-emergence anymore. No more pre-emergence. Another thing that I'm planning on doing this winter, and I talked to Mrs. Stretch about it, is I want to get an ant bait spreader and turn it sideways and plant clover on my berms and then regular cover crop in the middles because now I've got, got a spot in the orchard that has phytophthora and I think I didn't break through, but the water's building up on me and I'm trying to figure out how to wick that moisture out. So, and then knock that cover crop off, maybe in the spring with rely and by summer, I'll be able, you know, it'll be okay for harvest, so. And then I, I have micro sprinklers and I have dual line drip. So for me to get an early start on the cover crop, I have the Netafem super net so I can get that water out to get the cover crop moving while we have some heat in the fall. That's all. <laughs> Again, getting off subject, it wasn't brought up. Uh, Silas had always promoted that here we're coming up to the fall as far as irrigation and our, our chlorides are a big deal, right? Uh, the worst field I had with chlorides, I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a test plot. Well, the Chachilla Water District had some water, very limited amount in October. So I went ahead and flood irrigated where I had my clovers. Okay, well, I, when I finally got my uh, test results for uh, July uh, samples, I, I cut that in half, my chlorides in half. So uh, I've got many sprinklers, but uh, my plan is 
La Nina, whatever comes my way, I'm, I'm flood irrigating uh, in October. Everything. And uh, because that's, we've always stressed about pushing those salts down. And we hit those, I did that just right, you know, we had those rains in December, so that just kept, kept pushing those salts. So I did not have the visual signs of burning in this one plot. And I've always heard that, but we're saying, well, oh, water, but you really don't lose that much water that time of year. I mean, it's gonna go down, if it's gonna go back to your aquifer for whatever, but uh, you don't have the evaporation like you would normally uh, right now. So, so a lot of folks were flood irrigating for chlorides uh, during the summertime, but I don't think that really, you get the benefit. Uh, you don't get that deep penetration, and then just throws your harvest wacky by, by doing that because of your different soil types. But the clovers, when, when, they, when they took off, my, uh, when we did plant in November, uh, boy, that's the, that was the best looking, obviously, the, the cover crop I ever had, and just trying to, you know, I, I probably could have backed off on water on it more than I did on that one specific plot. But that flood irrigating with chlorides is, uh, it's almost a must, really, to make, make an effect. Um, question for all three of you guys can take turns answering this. When you guys look to the future, what are some ideas that you want to implement, some rabbit holes that you are interested in investigating, or things that you want to do differently in the next few years than what you've done in the past? With what your system is, as far as almonds, pistachios, what you're planning on doing differently knowing what you have to do differently in the future with water? Um, so for me, when it comes to almonds, touched on a little bit, harvesting, uh, being able to harvest straight into a windrow instead of coming through and sweeping, um, being able to keep that coverage up on the berm all year long instead of removing it, you know, and then having this bare ground again and kind of starting from scratch. Um, that's what I want to see in almonds. Obviously, we see guys doing that, right? And they're doing it well and efficiently, so it's possible. Um, as far as pistachios go, this year I'm going to try just composting, not doing any synthetic uh, UN32. Um, so I'm going to compost in the fall, and then I'm going to come back and compost again in the springtime. And I'm going to see how that goes. Um, other than that, I don't really have anything else I want to change right now. Um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to still look into and, and keep, continue as far as if we get our, our cover crop going well after I start filleting, I'm going to start throwing, keep throwing it on the berms. Just, I don't want bare dirt. Uh, I mean, that, that's helped tremendously with anything as far as weed control. Yeah, you're not going to get everything 100% covered because you're afraid. I, I have many sprinklers, so I don't want to get stuff up off by the many sprinkler head. Um, but maybe I might try that at least two times before I peel it off. Not three times like Norma did, but I, I don't know how that, this, the rest of that story with her harvest, how, how it went. But, uh, uh, but even when I did that, I still had those clovers. There was a, you added a clover this last year. It was a little, a little yellow flower that just kind of kept growing and it, it was low stature. And I, so I, I think I was still getting a bit of it, maybe some, uh, some nitrogen fixation through that. Uh, there was, I want to try more, uh, you, hear, you hear about hedgerows, uh, pollinated hedgerows, that's, that's to keep the bees uh, active year round. So I purposely left uh, a, a strip on the outside next to my driveway. I said, okay, I can just let it go as long as I can. It was drying down and I said, okay, I'm going to flail it. All I got to do is get on my sweeper and I'm going to throw it out on my driveway just for dust control. Uh, but I never got to that point because it seemed like it broke down well enough. I didn't have to do that. But I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. Because a lot of times we'll, we'll throw our, our, our almond prunings, we'll, we'll stack brush down the driveway and let the grinder come in, and there's, there's our dust control. Well, why can't we do that with uh, our cover crops, even when they're, it looks, you know, and, and you've got this habitation of all your beneficials. I think I had a lot less plant bugs this year. I don't know if that was just a phenomenon. I didn't have to spray for them because I had just a ton of beneficials in that so-called hedgerow. It wasn't, you know, it's uh, it basically it's an annual, the way I was doing it, but um, I want to do that more. 
Um, change as needed with information as it arises and how it's applicable. Utilize my fifth element of grazing gophers and find a market for them. <laughs> yes. That's what I'm looking to do. We're still exploring that market of regenerative gopher meat, but yes. have not been able yes. to do that too well. Cover crops do attract gophers, yes. and that is a problem. And squirrels, and the, the squirrels eat the clover, and then the bait doesn't knock the squirrels out. So yes, that is becoming a problem. So, and then dirty neighbors that don't know how to keep take care of their squirrel problem. That's neither here nor there. Yeah, I think those are some things that we're constantly working on and trying to figure out are some of the ways that we can control gophers. We've played with different mixes that have neurotoxins in them. Seen mixed results on that. Some of it's actually been helpful. Some of it, we didn't really notice anything different. Um, but yeah, there's something that we're there that we're always playing with, trying to evaluate that. We'll throw in different species in there just to see if we can get them repelled, essentially. Gophers, there are certain types of clover, there are certain types of uh, brassicas that they don't like the smell of roots. And so we're trying to get those right varieties to where we can actually get them to be an effective tool. So that's a work in progress. So that's my thing that I'm working on the next few years, is trying to get rid of uh, animals that are destroying um, our ecosystem. Well, even though they are part of the ecosystem, I'm trying to terminate something, right? Eliminate. It's like, uh, eliminate. Yes. eliminate them. Not eliminate, eliminate. Yeah, well, <laughs> trying to eliminate them, but yes, I am eliminating them. Slowly, but limiting them for now. So. Um, any other last words? I believe food is ready. Um, so any other thoughts, any last questions? You won't be judged if you raise your hand because we're all waiting for food. I'll, I'll, I'll have a question for Andrew. You, you touched basis a little bit on uh, how much savings you've seen um, just with the use of uh, the system overall. How far from the, from the savings, what other possibilities or opportunities have you guys had to kind of monetize the use of the cover crop? Uh, well, you saw a picture of that kind of Mad Max looking vehicle pulling the bale out. That was on our property. So a few years ago, uh, you know, we kept running into this grass problem and it was mainly because we weren't terminating our cover crop early enough. Um, we didn't want to because we, all these beneficials were just going nuts in our field and we didn't, we just weren't ready to get rid of it. And so we just kind of kept thinking and thinking and we ended up meeting this guy who just knows pretty much everything there is to know about baling anything. And we started talking to him and we were telling him our ideas and everything and he got really interested. So last year we tried it out for the first time and it went okay, he had to make some tweaks. Uh, this year we went in and we built um, 220 acres of cover crop. And on, 20, on a 20 acre piece, uh, you know, that netted us an extra 12 grand. And I know that's not a ton of money, right, but it helps. You know, everything helps. And so it's just kind of figuring out ways to utilize this stuff better. We have guys all up in uh, you know the foothills here who have cattle that without this rain they're not they're just not getting the feed and they're going crazy over this cheaper feed that's crazy high in protein and nutrients and their animals are just loving it so we can actually meet another need there while also servicing our own right like we there's other parts of the industry where we can kind of fill holes you know and and supply what other people need you know so. Um, and there's still plenty of organic matter out there after we're done bailing it to, you know, help serve the needs that we, that we're looking for. Um, so it's just being creative and innovative and trying to find out, you know, other ways to do things. You know, there's not a lot of guys doing what we're doing here, right? So we're just trying to figure it out as we go. And I would just encourage you guys, you know, take the roadblocks out of your mind. You know, I was fortunate I didn't come for agriculture, so I didn't have all these roadblocks in my mind. That we're saying, well, you can't do it, you know, because of this or this or this. It's always like, okay, we can do it. Let's just figure out how, you know. And then every single time that you fail, it's great because you're never going to do it again. That's the best learning experience right there, you know. And so I, I would just encourage you guys, man, just step out of that, out of your comfort zone and just start thinking, you know. Um, when you're saving this much money, there's areas where, you know, you can flub up a little bit and you're still going to be okay. Um, but I, I would just encourage you guys just to... Uh, Think outside the box, you know. And me personally, I, I don't want—I don't want to offend anybody if there's PCAs in here. But I stopped listening to my PCA. I started paying attention to what my eyes are showing me out in the field, you know. And because those were two different stories I was giving, 
right? What I was, what he was telling me I needed to do versus what I was seeing. And I think, and you know, I, I hear a lot of times from guys, you know, they don't have the time to get out in the field, this and that. Well, man, that's your job. You know, that's where your money is. And you need to be in your fields paying attention because these guys are looking to sell your property, not CIS. These guys have been great. They are showing us how to get off of these products and get away from these products and, and keep our money on our farm. You know, and that's the way that we need to be thinking. We're paying middlemen all over the place, and these people are passing the buck on to us. Who do we pass it on to? We can't. Nobody. You know, it stops with us. And so we have to figure out ways to uh, generate what we need on our farm, right? Um, and we all have that capability. Farmers are some of the smartest, most innovative people I've ever met in my life. You guys can do it. You can. I mean, it's, we've been doing it for years. We've been finding success. We've been making more money while other people are losing money. Uh, we've been finding healthier trees, healthier products, right, in our fields. Um, I don't know. Just stop blocking yourself. Yeah. It's still late. One way that I started, you know, because I'm always looking, you know, I've seen the pros on people's. So I, I took three sets, three year patients, so I left one open, planted every other row, and I planted all the rows, right? The first year. So it's pretty low impact, right? And then I was able to evaluate. You know, and that's, I guess, it's kickstart. It's the it, you know, really. The, the NRCS now is, you know, they're, they've got a three-year program. And I think, you know, on these high-end diversity crops, you know, if you're high-end diversity cover crops, I think they're offering like $130 million. But that's how important I think it is. And, you know, we talked about this quarter acres in the next few years. It's, it's really important to keep the track you know, at the end of the day. So, that's a perfect way to start, and you start seeing the results, and, you know, minimize the same kind of risk. Yeah. And the biggest thing is just do something. Yeah. Right? That's a great place to start. So, well, I think with that, I thank you guys so much. Really appreciate, you know, the effort and the innovation that you guys have continued to help develop. and. I look forward to working with all you guys in a lot of different areas, our entire team working with you, because there are so many opportunities to make change. So I think with that, if you guys got any questions, we can stick around um, after tacos. We're going to be able to be here for a while, so we'll show you equipment. We can show you other random pictures of you know challenges that we've had and how we've overcome that. There's a lot to this. So um, I think with all of that, I think we're ready for food. So I'll have my dad, Matt. Pray for food. The moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? It's amazing to me to see all these things, how they fit together. And that causes me to praise God. And now as I give thanks for the meal that we're going to eat, that most of us, in fact all of us, have somehow participated in producing that for ourselves, our families, and to feed others. I give thanks for that, not in a way that I want to think that, oh, we need to appease God so He will bless us and so we can make money. It's more, I think we're just thankful we're, to see that His hand is that and that He also cares enough to send His Son for us. So let me pray for us. Thank you, Father, for being able to observe you in these things, the way things fit together, and even how we want to coach people through at CAS with understanding that there is a way that it all fits together and that that's only a part of the story of how you have created this creation of yours and that we see your fingers touching it. We give praise to you. We thank you too for those uh, deeper mysteries of you even having to chosen, having chosen to send your son to us and how that fits in with your greater plan. Thank you for this food. Uh, the hands that have fixed it, the joy we have from eating, and the joy of thinking, too, about how we have a hand in, in your creation to manage that, to steward it, to be the husbandry uh, stewards of making these things help people eat. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a good meal.